We're here to learn from our good friend Alec. He's going to enlighten us on some uh, homebrew, we should say. Yeah. So, Alec, why don't you tell people about yourself, give them your credentials. You're more than equipped to guide us on this magical journey, but let's, uh, you know, educate those who may not know. Well, um... Yes, I'm Alex Zam. I'm a pro DM, a purveyor of all things homebrew. Um, I run 12 to 15 games a week, as I have for the past couple of years now. Um, I've written several books. My last few books, I did a book of 100 uh, subclasses for 5e, a book of 100 spells for 5e, a book of 100 uh, ancestries, lineages, you know, player races, whatever you want to call it, for 5e, and... Um, I just did a book of 100 magic items for 5e. So I, I do have some clout to burn uh, in creating homebrew. Um, but I'm actually working on a big uh, collection of modules next and some other stuff. And my Inquisitor class comes out this week. So I'm a, I'm a busy boy making all sorts of homebrew. Yeah. And, you know, with everything going around Dungeon 23 and all that homebrew, it's, you know, it's the season. No, everyone wants to kick off with some fun mm. magic stuff. So, uh, before we get into the main lesson, let's talk about a quick side lesson and hop on the craze of Dungeon 23 that everyone's talking about right now. So, uh, Alec actually has a whole thing about building a dungeon, and please, okay. please, 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 if you're um, curious about stuff like this, there's always more. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is something I made for newer DMs. Um, I made this a while ago. I put it on my Kofi. I think it's like pay what you want for my Kofi, um, which means you get it for free if you want. But, um, but give me money. I got bills. Um, <laughs> but no, this is um, a little thing I wrote about writing an adventure and creating a dungeon. And I think dungeon in terms of D&D, gets uh, misunderstood because people think of, like, oh, well, it's this ancient ruin filled with traps and horrible... It's like, no, not necessarily. A dungeon is a self-contained area where there is risk and reward. Like, a, an open area, like a town or a village or even just, like, out exploring where you can go in any direction and it just doesn't matter. Like, that's not a dungeon. A dungeon is you go to a, its own little unique spot that this is it, this is where you're at. Um, there could be multiple ways in or out, but essentially, like, you're stuck there. And there's risk there, usually monsters or traps or guardians or other NPCs that are trying to stop you. Um, or it could even just be, like, weird magical effects or you have some kind of risk to being there. But you get a reward out of it. Um whether that reward is magic items, experience, um, you know, uh, gold, or even just like you learn valuable information that can help you down the road, you know. Um, so I, I've built many a dungeon in my day, and there was some stuff that I realized are part of every dungeon no matter what. Um, so it's like, first off, it's it's... I put a little thing about, you know, where the dungeon is located. And there's all sorts of stuff for that. Um, I did a little roll table if you want to. Why don't we roll something? Do we have dice? Uh, have dice? I do have some dice. Let me just grab good old Kerbo here. Let's make a dungeon. All right. So we're going to pull out a handy dandy D12, it says. And let's see how the chart goes. Fancy. So... We are looking for a location. Um, I don't know what to do. Uh, let's go. I got an 11. So, a magically 
placed inside a dream or a memory. Hmm. There you go. All yeah, right. See, so let's say, for instance, um, you know, back in, um, if we're going back in second edition, I want to say, there was the the Knight of Black Roses um, module with Lord Soth. Mm -hmm. And he has this magic mirror that lets him like see his past and his own downfall and um, touching the mirror to like transport you to this demi plane of his own memories. Um, so that's something you could do for an enemy or it could even be like you're investigating some wizard and he's like, oh no, where have I gone wrong? And you like go into his tower and you have to like search through his dreams to try and find a way to dispel all the nonsense in his tower, you know. Mm. Or you could even do like a whole inception thing that you're like you're trying to infiltrate someone's dream to plant something there or you know yeah isn't there a whole spell too it's a ninth or eighth level spell i believe that's basically you and a few other people transport to the astral plane uh dream of the blue veil yeah, yeah. so couldn't there be a situation where uh a evil abolith or a god or something finds you in your party and traps you mm -hmm. under some crazy high-level power dream of the blue veil and now you gotta escape the abolus mind dungeon absolutely um any kind of mind palace dream memory like weird which the thing that's nice about that is you don't have to conform to the laws of physics or reality it, when it's in a dream or memory you can just have weird shit all over the place <laughs> so uh, yeah, you guys are walking upside down now. The spell reverse gravity is always in effect for this one room, pretty much. Right. Oh, wow. Um, you know, it's like you go into a room, and there's like a big puzzle, and then you solve it, and then like the room suddenly flips the other direction, and now you have to like deal with some stuff. You know, you can do anything you want. Anything you want. Like the laws of, of physics are, are yours to play with now. All right. Now, once you have the location, you think about the history of what has created, affected, and then finally, like, become of that dungeon now. So, the example I gave is, let's say there was, this is the one I've given here, there was, like, this dwarvish city, like, settlement, you know, it's deep underground for these, like, silver mines, mm -hmm. and then it's, like, right by this, like, underwater lake. Right, but there's a uh, an attack during that, like some goblins attack. They destroy a section of wall, and like the underground lake just floods into this like settlement and floods the whole place. Okay. So as the party like goes further and further down, they learn this history, and it doesn't need to be obvious. You know, they don't need to learn every detail of everything that happened, but they like. Okay, there was a settlement here, and now it's flooded. But then they could like later see, like, oh, look at this broken section here, and that leads out into a giant lake. You know, clearly that's what happened. Hmm. Huh. So, with that so, knowledge armed with us, let's see what the history of our mind palace is then. Yeah. And we got a five. So, a dangerous monster has nested in this dungeon. Yeah, so for this, we could say, okay, it's in someone's dream or memory. Let's say probably their dreams, right? Mm -hmm. And then some dangerous... Mo so this could be a fear from Spelljammer. This could be a mind flayer is, like, playing with someone's mind and has, like, infested their mind with horrible stuff. Mm. And Aboleth is, like, toying with you. Um, Aren't there, like, yeah. parasites that, like, feed on your mind like this, too? Um, There's all sorts of nasty shit like ugh. that. So it could be, like, oh, some powerful wizard... Right, and mm -hmm. then like, you know, some monster while they're sleeping gets them and starts <laughs> infecting their mind with horrible must or like an actual like I said like a fear or, you know, a mind flare tadpole or something. Mm -hmm. And then you have to go into their dreams to fight the monster there. You know. Oh yeah, that, that's. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do with that. You can even say like. Put a reversed, uh, reverse it on people and say, let's say, if it is some giant benevolent being or something like that, uh, you have this whole village, it's a powerful giant psychic benevolent being, and an evil wizard puts a virus or curse on it, and now it's projecting all of its psychic energy onto all these 
unknowing inhabitants and they're trapped in its mind palace. Yeah. Like there's there's a couple ways you could do this to be like really crazy. Hmm. Like let's say the party has a very powerful wizard friend or like a very powerful spellcaster friend. You know. And then like they start going crazy or like wild magic shit starts happening like oh what's going and you like go to their tower and you find them asleep and you're like what the fuck is happening and then you like learn like oh we got to go into his dreams to defeat this monster or elsewise he's going to keep casting magic in his sleep and like destroy shit around us you know and our friend will die yeah it's so terrifying. that raises the stakes or you could even be like start the party off session one you're in some little small town things start getting more and more out of hand and it's like wow something is wrong reality is broken they destroy some monster and then it like zooms out and basically the party is like oh you're like stuck in some like mind flayer nautiloid and all of you are like strapped down and you just like woke up out of the matrix style <laughs> that everything you've experienced so far in the campaign was like a projection that the mind flayers did to keep you docile. That's crazy. Like you literally wake up out of the matrix and now you got to escape this nautiloid. You know, like there's so much shit you could do with that. And we've rolled two things. All right. Well, let's see what this third roll, how it changes this dungeon. This should be who currently lives in the dungeon. Who's well, there? We got another five. So that is wandering hungry beast oh that's okay that perfectly fits well this theme yeah so in the dream you find that it is overrun with just like wild monsters you know just running all over the place so let's say you know the dream if we go with that second idea of like oh you're in some town but then like monsters start attacking it's the mind flayers are fucking with you you know yeah. or like people's like emotions are getting the best of them so then it's like maybe that people start to realize like all of these monsters are like my worst fears that mm -hmm. i dealt with as a child you know like manifesting in my mind so it's like one dwarf in the party is like oh my family was taken out by an umber hulk and then an umber hulk attacks you know mm -hmm. or like maybe it's like oh you know i fought an owl bear and then like two owl bears show up or something and that works right with the fear like you were talking about earlier. It's literally a fear attacking you. You got a fear of beast? All of these beasties are coming after you. Yeah. You have to face your fears to to escape this dungeon. Yeah. That, just knowing who's in there, once again, that can change a lot about that. And yeah, I did this unique features. This is an optional one, mm -hmm. but I'd like to add another complication. What I suggest to DMs, and especially newer DMs do this all the time, and I still I still suffer from it myself. Like, we all are creative people, so we get ahead of ourselves. But you create what's called a hat on a hat, which is like you have one cool, interesting thing, and then you put another interesting thing on top of that, but they can't really support each other, so then it kind of falls apart. Mm -hmm. So if you are like, this is a really good idea, and you keep adding and adding it, take something back. <laughs> Like, don't feel like you have to, if you have a cool, solid idea, you can be fine with that and move on to other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but let's roll this and see what it is. And we may use it, we may not. Okay. And, oh, this is interesting. We got two. Time flows differently within the dungeon. This Perfect. actually kind of works if you're in a magical plane within a dream or a memory. Yeah, so what that means is, as the party's progressing through this little town, then time starts to act weird. And what I would do is, let's say you defeat someone or someone dies, and then all of a sudden it goes like, and like the party remembers, but everything reverses, and they're like not dead anymore. Mm. And you're like, what the fuck? And it's like, that's what happened. What are you going to do? Or you could even play in a non literal sense that let's say the party's going, they go into some house, and there's like a a monster attacking some family and you like defeat it and then you like see the family it's attacking and the family disappears and you're like wait a second this was me an owlbear attacked my house when I was a kid and killed my parents this is my house when I was a kid what the fuck is going on like yeah that's cool there's a lot of cool things you can do with that especially if time flows differently and we're going with let's say if it's something more malicious like a fear 
would it be a stretch to say, oh, the fear is worried about you getting too close, so it's trying to trick you into thinking the party's aging rapidly? Oh, yeah. It's like you can put a, a harsh time limit on stuff. You could even play it in a mechanical sense of like, oh, everyone immediately has slow cast on them to make a fight more complex. Oh, that, wow. That, like, it's moving faster and the party's moving slower. You know? Yeah, and all this off of one dice, and you got things that roll together. This is, like... I mean, it's almost... What's the thing called uh, for... It's escaping my mind now. Not fist bands. Uh, Tasha's. The Tasha's roll. Die roll. For uh, yeah, Lineage. It's... It's, that was a, a, a big idea I had. And in fact, if you scroll up to page 5, mm -hmm. um, this is location tables. Oh, cool. So if you want to create something, you need a location. I just put some stuff that I thought would be fun, and I put it Arctic, Coastal, Desert, for you know, the typical stuff. I even did Unusual Plains and then Modern Locations. So yeah, you could just use this to build upon it. So we have our whole dungeon idea, right? But where did the party go to encounter this? So let's say uh, we're doing unusual planes. This is an unusual venture. Where did they go to encounter this? And, oh, this is a D6. Let me grab my D6. Burp, burp. And on this D6, I rolled a 6. So with unusual planes, they're in the demi-plane of the dread. Yeah, so what that means is, like, you're in... Barovia, or Lamordia, or Falkovnia, or, like, you know, um, one of the, like, um, on catch or something like that. Like, you're in a fucked up demiplane of dread, and while you're there, the real problem is that, like, your dreams and memories and your past mm -hmm. and your fears have become this domain of dread. And unless you defeat the Dark Lord there and, like, banish this, like, monster, it's like, you'll never escape. And your body will die. Yeah. Like. It, and you're trapped in your own mind. With something literally inside of this hellscape. That's great. Yeah. Do all tell me what's dread end with IA? Uh, a lot of them do. A <laughs> shocking number of them do. In fact, let me actually check because I have Van Richten's guide. Um, I mean, I know all my favorites do. Uh, thanks for stopping by, Ina. Uh, I think I literally just mentioned the ones that end in IA. Yeah, there's Barovia, and then there's like Bluetspur, Borka, Darkon, um, Harakir, Haslan, Ikath, Kalakiri. So I, I just, my favorites end in IA. Barovia, <laughs> uh, Lamordia, and. That, um, the uh, IA makes a difference. Yeah. <laughs> Akovnia is a really cool one. Lamordia is my favorite. It's my favorite domain of, of Dread. Um, check it out if you have Van Richten's get. Or Google it. I, I mean, you know, whatever. Well, once again for Dungeon 23, that concludes this mini-adventure. Um, there's a lot that you can do with dungeons, and, like, just to even highlight, like, a random thing, I do not have it up right now, but I know there's a dungeon that Alec Let's Play and I've talked about a little bit before Honey, I'm Home, which mm -hmm. is fun. <laughs> like, as a player, I don't want to spoil the twist and stuff if anyone does through that, but like, it's a great example that you can have a threatening dungeon and it doesn't have to be like, all doom and dread. Like, I took... Yeah, the... <clears throat> Well, go ahead. No, it's like the great thing about this, it, it's a dungeon based around honey and something sweet and something so innocent as like a bee holder and all that. But like, mm -hmm. we're still playing in a world where these things are killing people. There's a lot you right. can do with that implication. Like, the jelly that comes from the honey, and mine, like I told you, a guy ate so much honey that it literally came out of him. Yeah, scared to shit out of my and, party. And the thing too is, I I tell, especially again, like newer DMs, but even long time DMs do this, where it's like, if you start off an adventure super serious, the only direction it can go is silly. Okay, because if you start really dark, 
the only the only way people will make jokes because any D and D game, I don't care if it's like a home game or if we're talking like a big crazy like critical role kind of style. People want to have fun when they're playing, so they're gonna crack a joke. So then the tension is gone, and people start like joking around and laughing and doing this and that. So if you start really really serious, it is hard to maintain that energy for a whole campaign. But if you start kind of silly then you can go really serious with something and the party's like whoa i didn't expect that and then you kind of go back silly again and they're like okay but the stakes are real i know this is silly but like i also know that some crazy shit could happen Mm -hmm. whereas if it starts serious and you go silly they're like that's stupid and it kind of pulls you out of it so you're like let's just be serious again and people don't like you know um i've i've had adventures where like the it started off like you know like game of thrones and basically turned into the muppets <laughs> you know but um if you but once it became silly then it just stayed like that and it's just kind of when you have serious characters doing silly things it's just kind of like all right but if you i've had campaigns that started like the muppets and then basically became Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. but with Muppets, which was like really fucking fun. So I tell people, I'm like, don't be afraid to be a little silly, you know, yeah. um, or at the very least, if silly isn't the right word, like, don't be afraid to like have something that is pure fun and then start to take it into a, a high stakes place, you know? Mm-hmm. And like, I think mixing genres with different settings based on player action can do a lot of fun stuff. Like, great example that I think of it, when we played uh, Wild Beyond the Witchlight, I basically turned that whole sa- campaign into a heist movie for Dr- Lupo. Mm-hmm. Like, every time, oh, we're at a new witch, how am I going to break in and steal their stuff? It, it felt like Ocean's Eleven instead of, like, I got that we were in the Feywild and there's a lot of danger going on, but we quickly made our solution to everything. Yeah, let's just steal it and not fight the witch. Right. Where then you tell me the other group that went through, they made the I hate Fairyland and basically murdered everything. Yeah. Every every group is going to approach problems differently. So keeping your expectations uh, open is always the best way to to handle it um if you'll see the book that's like my look you know my thing here for creating an adventure it's like i always say like you want to start off with a basic idea okay um a location you know and there's going to be i i I break it down into settlements wilderness and dungeons so settlements are cities towns even like caravans on the road you know a place that people are like we're safe there might be stuff happening but like we're 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 good you know um this is a place where people focus mostly on like role playing um handling you know like buying and selling stuff uh learning information you know shit like that um and i talk about like fun little things you can add for more detail wilderness is traveling this is going on the road crossing mountains and rivers and going across you know wherever this is the traveling part um i tend to breeze through travel because i'm not as big a fan of like long wilderness exploration unless it's key to the campaign like tomb of annihilation or something Mm -hmm. um but there can i've seen people who are like oh yeah um we were traveling from this settlement to like this other place on the side of the mountain and it's supposed to take us, like, uh, four days in-game. It took us, like, 12 sessions. And I'm like, I would I would set myself on fire if I could <laughs> go through that. That sounds like a nightmare. But they love it, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, because they handle every little thing on the road, and that that's the campaign. I get bored with that, so I tend to preserve it. But then you have dungeons, which is, that is what you typically travel to, from a settlement to a dungeon. Um, which, as I said, is... Not necessarily a, a ruin or a dungeon or a crypt or something, 
but it's a self-contained location that has risk and reward. Um, as far as the actual quest, um, you can see I put like a very basic plot. There's not many actual plots in the world. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's, um, I think according to a lot of literature, and, and this is something I consider myself, there's actually only nine real plots, um, but they break down to, like, man versus man, man mm. versus god, man versus self, like, man, you know. But, like, I put some, some basic stuff in there, and then I did, like, a little plot hook, like, why should the party care about doing that quest? You gotta give them a reason. The reason mm -hmm. doesn't always have to be money, but money is usually a deciding factor for people. Um, moving the plot along, and then having complications. If they go point A to point B with nothing happening in between, and it all works out and everything is fine, that's a really boring fetch quest. You have to have complications to make it fun. Mm -hmm. And you can have a coincidence, or something intentional. Coincidence, yeah, you'll see I put stuff like bad weather or when the party shows up if the place is already under attack oh no like or there oh there's a disease in town like that's a coincidence mm -hmm. something intentional is like yeah the villain's henchman shows up or um someone's like a warlock their patron tells them to do something or like suddenly you know an assassin is hired to like take down the party right yeah and then you want to have encounters as you go, whether it's combat um, or non-combat. Always important to sprinkle in some non-combat encounters. Mm -hmm. Just to fill time. So, using this as a filter then, let me uh, step you through why I had my first party go through in a, a recent campaign that they just did, and they broke in through the beginning session. Okay. So, um, let's go to, of course, we are starting the adventure where to begin so my party started their adventure i gave them a little map and i said hey we're going to start our adventure here in this big old map way over here they had fun drawing uh, a little chart but i said hey your adventure starting here i let them know generally what these four nations were like and how they felt about each other and they drew this fun little chart. This is uh, Nazi Germany. This is North and South Korea. This country wants nothing to do with any of them. And everyone else is trying to get their favor, basically. And they're like, oh, okay, cool, got it. A little bit of politics. So I'm like, all right. None of your characters are from here. So none of you care about that politic. Just, that's the theme of this area. So when you get there and these people are like this, you're not surprised. Right. All right, so they know they're in a kind of racist country. Cool. Then we move on to what's next. We got uh, we got a general location, specific location. Uh, they start in a small town. It's a nothing town. Uh, doesn't really matter the name. Always a little small village. Why are they there? Um, they're looking for the MacGuffin. They have all heard rumors of something called a Yig Seed. General MacGuffin, they need powerful ancient item. So retrieve magical item from a dangerous location. They know the dangerous location is this racist town, this racist country. They want the magical item. All right. Uh, plot hooks. Their plot hook is each is driven by destiny. So um, secret information was not undermining the villain, but to each individual character let's see complications the complications is the city stole the MacGuffin they're looking for and turned it evil there you go that's an intentional complication yep and the non-combat encounter they had is now they're trapped in the shadow fell and they need to figure out how to get out there you go and, and oh sorry go ahead uh, what was I saying it's like and especially, like, starting in a big adventure like that, um, I always say, like, it's best to, like, plan for the beginning and, like, have this idea of, like, okay, this is how they'll start. And there's some, something that'll, you know, some plot hooks that'll get them, you know, ready to, to deal with it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, if it's a one shot, tell people like this is the quest, this is what you're doing, and you know it's a one shot. Let's just come on, don't. We're not going to spend the first half an hour of a one shot with you haggling over deciding whether or not you're going to do the quest that I am specifically <laughs> made for this. If it's a campaign, then sure, ha- maybe have some options. But even then, if you have a thing, you should in session zero be like, look, this is the main quest. Like first session, you're going to do it but figure out why your your person would care. And then you can work with them, like, backstory-wise as to why they care. Mm-hmm. But then once you introduce those plot hooks, then, like, the party is like, oh, you know what, let's let's go and get this MacGuffin. And then you start, like you're saying, it's like, oh, now they're in the shadow fell. It's like, fuck, well, we still got to get the MacGuffin, but we also got to get the hell out of here. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, I'm glad you brought that up, because it helped me reframe how their second session went. So, I told you they're stuck in the Shadowfell and everything, since we're on the topic of dungeon building. Something I, interesting I did for their dungeon is I actually made their, dun- their first dungeon as their home base. So, I wanted the, the party to get used to exploring it. So, when they got stuck in the Shadowfell, they ended up here. Which, this is their home base. I didn't explicitly say that. I was like, hey, you're at an unknown mansion. You've never been here before. You know? And the MacGuffin is somewhere in this building. Because of the nature of D&G and magic, blah, 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 the MacGuffin turned out to be the entire building because D&D does weird stuff. But not getting into that, um, the point is, the party, then, this is their first dungeon, they spent the whole second session exploring this dungeon, doing puzzles in it and everything, really getting to know this area, right? Until they finally get to the boss area of the dungeon which is the basement and down here they found their MacGuffin they met the first big bad blase blase and once they were done they expected to be transported out to Shadowfell and I'm like no you found it you're here there's no more combat this is your home base now and I expected them to be like oh cool let's Go to the next thing now, because they just spent the entire encounter exploring this dungeon. And, right. you know, it, it has three floors to it. There's a basement. There's the upper floor. Which, you know, they all went to and had fun and everything. And once they were done exploring the dungeon and got their MacGuffin, I was like, all right, yeah, they're going to leave. No. No. Now that the dungeon was safe, they took the time. Literally the whole second session was them just hanging out in this base. Yeah. And I didn't realize until, like, you had brought it up to me the second time. You're like, okay, if I spent all this time getting them invested to this dungeon that they're now intimately knowledgeable about, and then I just say, now it's your home base. Yeah, of course the players are going to spend the whole rest of the session exploring this dungeon that's their home now. In a yeah. different way. So, it was fun watching my players basically go from exploring a dungeon that's hostile to, oh, it's safe here now? Well, let's explore this dungeon that's our home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's anytime you're like, all right, well, then then the players are going to do this. It's like, nope. No, they won't. <laughs> um, so, it's it's always... A matter of like if you give someone a place to explore if you give someone an item or you give someone something they're gonna want to do something with it so giving players agency and choice is a very good thing the problem is if you're too liberal about it and like give them too much choice, then they can either become like paralyzed by choice because there's too many options they don't know what to do or they will they will abuse it and like make a choice that you didn't want them to make. So if it's something that like, like okay, well here's these. I hope they don't pick this one. Guess which one they'll pick. <laughs> yeah. Um. But that's a that's a fun quest. It's like it's it gives you, you know, a place to explore. It gives you a home base to to go back to. It just gives you a lot of options, um, which I think is part of being a good DM is like. Players should feel like their choices matter. They should feel like they have agency in the world. And they should feel... Um, I mean, they should be having fun, no matter what they're doing. Like, if 
even if they make a mistake or make a choice that they're like, oh, that was the wrong choice. And it's like, there's still fun in that because you realize, like, okay, my choices really matter. And even if they're like, well, it's, I'm frustrated that I made the wrong choice, they're not frustrated with the game. They're frustrated with the choice that they made. Mm -hmm. Like Trigger um, whereas, sitting on that Chardalan statue. Right. I mean, that, like, I wasn't mad at the player that that happened, but... Yeah, Trigger's mad now because she just endangered literally herself and their entire family off of... Um, yeah, off of one choice. And the thing is, like, that is frustrating, but what it means is that opens up new avenues that you can go down, whereas if you just shut shit down, it's like, well, now, oh, rocks fall and everyone dies. It's like, that's not a choice. That sucks. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, I've I've had where... You know, I present some devil's bargain to the party, and I'm like, this is crazy. No one would ever pick this. And then they take it. <laughs> and it's like, okay. And it changes the campaign, and you have to be able to adapt to that. Um, but there's other stuff that if you have something that you need to happen for the party, mm -hmm. they need to fight this bad guy. They need to deal with this thing. They need to find this MacGuffin or do this. Then it has to happen no matter what they choose. Um, I always tell people, like, Oh, they have to fight some bad guy because they have to meet someone to like learn some information. He has something they need, vital information they need, or a magic item they need. And you're like, okay, there's three towns you can go to. Whatever town they pick, that's where that guy shows up. Doesn't matter. Because it's important. Mm -hmm. But if it's not important, then they go wherever they want and just come up with stuff that happens there. Um, but if it's, if it's important... And if there's other stuff like, oh, they're they're searching this dungeon and trying to find something important. It's like, oh, this... and then they like go to the room that it's in. You're like, all right, it's hidden in this thing. And then they're like, okay, everyone made investigation checks and everyone got a nat one. You can't be like, well, I guess they just are locked here and the game is broken now because they just soft lock themselves out. It's like, no, they still find it, but now there's consequences mm -hmm. because like oh, well, everyone whiffed it on their roll to find it. So it's like, you find it, but you set off some traps, or, like, you find it, but, like, guess who is checking the room at the same exact time you're all rooting around is, like, the bad guy who lives there or something. Like, you can fail forward, um, but it's like, if something is crucial, it has to happen no matter what the party does. Yeah. Um, the, the stakes then change to, <laughs> like, the consequences if they fail when that is involved. So, you know. an example of that could be then where they are right now. This dungeon, I have, this is where they need to go. This is right. the main place they need to go. And I, the, the dungeon was set up, which, coming through here, they would reach this area first. So I was like, alright, I'll make it a really hard DC check. If they succeed, bam! They figure out where they need to go, and it's optional if they explore over here or whatever, you know? Cool. But they all failed. And I'm like, oh, cool, you failed? Now you have to go through this long hallway where one of them got ambushed, deal with this fight right here. Then come here. After you're done, this will give you the answer to this. And now they get to yeah. go there now. So I was just like, all right, I'll just deny them a shortcut because I want them to go there. But if they fail, they just get... They're rewarded, well, I mean, they're punished, but rewarded with more gameplay. Yeah, and it's, like, I even had one earlier today. The party is in this dungeon, and I said that they found some, like, treasure hunter, like, evidence of, like, treasure hunters who had been there before and failed horribly in their task and died and, you know, been taken captive and all this stuff. Well... <clears throat> They find one man who he had lost both of his eyes after he'd been taken prisoner, and then, like, he had been feeble-minded. So he's just worthless. And they're like, oh, should we just put him out of his misery? Should we, like, just walk around him because he doesn't even know we're there? Like, what do we do? And they're like, well, let's try talking to him. And I'm like, he can't communicate. He's feeble-minded. And they're like, okay, well, I guess that's it. But the cleric is like, no, no. I will do greater restoration so he's no longer people minded. I'll do regenerate to get his eyes back. 
Like, they cast several high-level <laughs> spells to save him. And I could have been like, I wanted him to be feeble-minded. Yeah. But what I did was, he's like, okay, I know the, the layout of this place. He's like, I was captured. He's like, if you help me, like, get out of here, I'll tell you everything you need. So yeah, I just, like, revealed a bunch of the map. And he's like, watch out, there's a trap over here that I almost fell for. Watch out, there's this. So he, like, walked them through, which is nice for them. Because because they risked those resources to save him, they were rewarded with a bunch of shortcuts. Hmm. He, like, goes to a room and they're like, oh, let's go. And he's like, nope, that room sucks. Full of traps and there's nothing in there worth it. And they're like, cool, thanks, and moved on. Nice. You know, but... The problem is they just got into a fight, and it's like, he is still weakened, so he got his ass kicked, and he got killed again. Oh. They just revivified him at the end of the session, but, like, they know that, like, this place is really, really dangerous, mm -hmm. and he has helped them avoid some of the... But I'm like, but there's areas of the map that he has not been to yet, so that means that when they get there, they'll, they've been relying on him, and then he'll be like, well, I don't know what this area is, and they're like, oh, shit, and they gotta, like figure it out for themselves i see but if they're willing to put in the work they should get a reward or a shortcut for it but it's like if they all fail that doesn't mean that oh, it's like oh it's like he has crucial information they need to know it's like they it's like i guarantee that they'll they'll cast regenerate and greater restoration it's like no you know if i expect that they'll go into the room and just be like oh pff, he's worthless all right, slit his throat, let's get out of here. Then that information is lost, and they don't learn it, and they're fucked. It's like, that would suck. Yeah. So it's like, if I'm doing a mystery, the clues should be found regardless of what the party does. Mm -hmm. It just might mean more work if they fail in their initial attempt to find the clues. I see. Um, before we switch topics from dungeons and uh, encounter building, I had one last question I want to touch on and that is uh player mercy versus player um i guess dm mercy versus dm cruelty i guess and i don't want to phrase it like that but i'll use this as another great example here so i have players they're going through his they're being cautious and everything but first mistake they make this room they didn't check it for traps right here this two room their uh sorcerer gets lit up bad trap goes off right in front of his face. They're like, okay, maybe we should be more cautious. So, I was already nice by saying they snuck in this building. They avoided a really hard combat to get in here. But, I was like, hey, you know, if you make too much noise in here, obviously the people they snuck by will hear what's going on, right? Yeah. They're, uh, and this is where I kind of walked back my original decision. Their fighter decided that he did not care about the druid's past without a trace. He was going to cast invisibility and go willy-nilly into this area right here and ran into a nasty ambush I had set with a bunch of shades and ghosts. Long story short, it didn't end well with him, and he ended the encounter with, like, I think 10 or 9 strength. Brutal. Yeah, so it's a shade. He can get back on a short rest, I knew that they had a harder boss fight up here to deal with. And he also just made a bunch of noise. So the bad that they just avoided, which was a really hard fight, now we're coming to look for them. I chose to be a little nicer and said, okay, these two rooms, which originally I was just going to have as nothing rooms, I said this room they could try to hide in and this room is a bedroom. And if they hide, maybe they could get the rest in here. Be, if they don't set off the trap. So, the party hidden here, successfully, barely, but successfully, and then they went in here, and I let them get a short rest before this fight up here that they had, which they easily beat. Right. Now, I had talked to a friend about it, and my friend said, because he's a DM as well, and he was like, oh, if... The guy went invisible and went marching down that hallway and alerted a bunch of bad guys and got caught by a shade and got messed up and pretty much threw the whole element of surprise that the party worked for all the way up until this last moment. 
I would have just crashed everything upon them all at once and not even given them the short rest. Um, the thing is, that's probably more realistic as to what would happen if this were, you know, like, someone was actually exploring a dungeon. Um, but that sucks. And it's not fun. And it also means, like, if someone's invisible and they're exploring ahead, like, yeah, they can actually set off an ambush and then there's like, oh, especially if they're scouting ahead, they are, like, alone and it's brutal. And it's like, okay, they've suffered. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I think that there are many steps that a DM can take where it's like, oh, this would be really brutal and I could do this. It's like, you could, but why would you? Or it's like, you could, but, like, if you were a player and that happened, would you think that that was fun or fair? Um, it's like, sure, maybe. And and I will say, there are plenty of DMs who are like, no, I'm more old school, I just like it to be rough, and if they die, they die, and who gives a shit, and nothing matters. But I find it hard to connect with characters that way, and I find it hard for, as a player, for myself to have fun if, like you know, every little choice I make has to be second-guessed because I know that I'm going to drop dead at any second. Um, but yeah, it's like, you know, it's like, unless your players like a brutal, it's a sucky move. Yeah. The, the, the thing is, there's many ways to handle stuff like that. Um, some DMs are like, nope, it's just brutal and fuck you. Mm-hmm. And it's like, cool, work on your anger issues, son. Like, that's, you know... Um, now, for myself... I would approach it probably the same way you did and been like, okay, you can take a short rest if you want. Or even something like, okay, like, in that room, you guys find an extra healing potion or something. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, or it's like, oh, you find a spell scroll of, like, greater restoration because, like, oh, well, we know there's shades here. What if one of them accidentally hurts me? The, like, I have a spell scroll of, like, greater restoration. You know? I might still gate it of, like, they have to find it or be looking for it. Sure. Mm-hmm. Now, your earlier thing is you mentioned the trap that the sorcerer set off. Um, how do you do traps? So, um, I do traps. Basically, uh, they need to check for traps, obviously. Perception check. If they find the trap, then they can disarm it. And um, I have, basically, single target traps and AoE traps. The trap that he set off, he actually didn't set it off. It was an AOE trap. He was just behind the person that set it off and failed his check. Um, so right here, the way that I specifically do it too, because the player asked, I say when you're going to pick the lock, that's when the trap goes off, not when you go to open the door. Because you can successfully pick the lock, the mage hand, and open the door, and the trap could go off or whatever. I feel like... That kind of defeats the purpose of the trap. The trap should go off if someone's trying to break in. Sure. So, um, I basically just do it like that. If it's an AoE trap, I ask, what's your formation? Are you all huddled behind the door? Okay, all dodge. If it's a single person trap, just make the single person make the single dodge. But that, that's it, basically. Just a simple perception to see if they see it. What I, what I do, and mine's like a little different. If a player, if players are actively going through hallways, if they're actively moving, going through halls, going through rooms, this and that, um, I'll I assume in a dungeon that they're actively looking for traps, um, mm-hmm. or I'll even ask like, are you okay? You guys are like checking for traps, and they're like, yeah. Um, if if it's low level and they just started, and they're like, okay, I'll just go in here, guns a blazing. I'm like, cool. But if they're like, let's go slow, and we want to be stealthy as we're going through here, we're checking for traps. I'm like, okay. And I use their passive perception. Now, there are a few that I'm like, passively, they're not going to find um, that are hidden. And those ones I'll get to in a, a moment. But basically, as the party is going, I'm usually like, okay, you go through here, you see down this hallway, like you notice that these tiles are a little like raised up a quarter of an inch, or you see that there's like these arrow slits in the walls. Um, or even if it's like an old dungeon, like crypt, uh, that people have tried before, then what I'll do is like, oh, you find a skeleton, like in the middle of this room that has like old crossbow bolts in it. And they're like, 
okay, something's something's wrong, <laughs> you know. Um, or it's like this. Oh, all the previous rooms have been filled with like dust and this and that. Like this room is fucking perfectly clean, immaculate, because there's a, you know, a gelatinous cube in here, mm -hmm. right? Like I'm like this room is perfectly clean. They're like okay, something's wrong. Like if you give them a little hint that something's wrong, then they'll be like okay. Now I will actively look for a trap in this room. So when they're traveling, I use passive to see what they notice and what mm -hmm. they don't notice. If the, once they enter each room, if there is a trap in there, you know, or if there is some, I'll be like, okay, you notice something is wrong, which might be the best that their passive gets them. They don't okay. notice the specific, but I'm like, you see something is wrong. Then they're like, okay, I will actively look for something in here, in which case they make the checks. They find it or they don't. Um, but usually, I find the best way to, to handle a trap, because the fun with a trap is dealing with it, mm -hmm. is, okay, you go and you, like, first couple, you spot automatically, no problem, no check required, doesn't matter what their passive is, you find a dead body that's already sprung the trap, or you find the switch, or the tripwire, or the this or that, you find the setup of the trap. Mm-hmm. And then deal with how they disarm it. If it's something as simple as like, oh, I make a thieves tools check, great. But if it's like, no, it's more complex than that. There's a tripwire that leads to this pulley that does this. And then they're like, oh, shit, we got to get past multiple things to get past. It. Oh, let me jump over this. And then you can set them up of like, okay, I see that there's a spike here. Um, all right, I'll just jump over it. I'm like, okay, you jump over the spike pit. And then that set of tiles instantly falls underneath because the spike pit was there, but it's an illusory floor just past it. I'm like, if they make an assumption of what the trap is based off of the setup, then they can kind of fall for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whereas if it's something like, oh no, uh, I'll, I'll investigate further to be like, is this the whole setup? Is this everything I need to know? So you can kind of play with, with players' perceptions that way. I see. But yeah. I, I think a trap is more fun if they can find it, or even like, oh, you step into a room and like, as soon as you step in, you hear like a shink and this like, chick, 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 and like things start counting down. What do you do? How do you react? If they're like, let me jump out of the way, which could be dangerous, or like, let me stand still and stay on the pressure plate, or like, let me do this or do this. Like, give them that moment that they've set off the trap. But they have a moment to react, and then if it's like, oh, wrong move, it had like a dead man switch. As soon as you jumped off, it goes off. Or like, okay, it's like, oh, it's like you, it's like, it's like, oh, let me do this. It's like, it can either work or it cannot work. I see. Um, that's the one thing that was fun to do about this ambush, actually. So you see how yeah. this hallway was like this. One thing that was great about this is. This isn't specifically. I love how this map doesn't have this hallway lit at all. Mm -hmm. Everywhere else is lit. So I was like, oh, I'll use the map's natural lights. They can see, they can zoom, and the players instantly picked up on that, thankfully. But as you can see, this is a very long hallway. So their dark vision stopped. I knew no matter what they had, there's no way that they could see past here. Yeah. And that's where I had the shade at. And this, I said, was an inch crack. And that's where the shades were rating in this room. The ghosts were in these two here. So I was like, because they had been cautious so far, passed without a trace, sneaking through. So I was like, okay. If they take the time to realize that this hallway is pitch black and they can't see through it, maybe they'll interact with it differently. And they saw, oh, yeah, we can't see all the way through this hallway. It's really dark. And that's when the blood fighter said, oh, well, I'll just go invisible and just walk down it. It's like, okay. Well, that's the opposite of what you should do, given where you are. Like, you're in the shadow fell. Why would you go towards darkness? Right. So, uh, th th that's, that's the fun they, I had with that. That's how they learn, you know. And I think, too, like, you can even set up expectations. Like, that let's say they go into a dungeon, and they, the first few traps, they find dead bodies. Mm -hmm. And then they start to find, like, traps that have been disarmed. You know, and then it's like they find stuff where it's like then the traps start to space out a bit of like, okay, this one, you know, it's like the first couple you find 
disarmed traps. And then you start to find dead bodies where it's like, okay, well, whoever was going through here missed these traps and died. But then it starts to go, like, then you start finding traps that are still armed, but there's no dead bodies. Like, oh, they didn't make it this far. Right? I see. And, but they're, like, finding stuff of, like, oh, well, someone, you know, put, like, it's like, it's like oh, you see the pressure plate, you see this. But then you start to find more and more stuff that is, like, if they're not actively looking, they don't find it anymore. So then it becomes more and more dangerous the deeper into the dungeon you go. I so see. it's like, yeah, if, you know, the first one might be like, oh, here's a pressure plate that has a crushed skeleton, you know, in front of it. It's like, okay, if you step on that, it just goes, and like, crushes you. Yeah. So they know, okay, I'll just jump past it. And then they start finding stuff where it's like, okay, here's a pressure plate, but no dead body. And like, all right, well, we'll disarm that. You know, or it's already disarmed or something. And then it's like, okay. Then they go, and then you start having stuff where it's like, okay, now instead of pressure plate, it's like very fine tripwire. Or it's like, you have to go to the end of this and pull a switch. Or you have to do this, or it's like, or this one, you just have to like deal with the monsters it releases or something. But then later on, it starts to become like a glyph of warding that's like, you have to search for it and it's really hard to find. Then it starts to become stuff like the symbol spell or like, you know, anti-magic fields or like weird traps that they can't handle. <laughs> they can't necessarily disarm or they just have to be like, how do we deal with this if we can't just use these tools to like undo this? Or it's like, how do we deal with this if we have to get through this trapped horrible puzzle room like Indiana Jones style? Because if we set off any of these traps, they could easily like kill us. I see. Yeah, that's a really unique way to use traps for world building and atmosphere building then. So the players get to realize as they go deeper in, this dungeon's getting more dangerous, traps are getting harder to see, and clearly yeah. adventurers other than us haven't made it this far because of the danger. Yeah, and if it's a mega dungeon like Tomb of Horrors style, the first few rooms are going to have a ton of skeletons and shit because a bunch of jackasses have tried to break into here, mm -hmm. and they... It's like, okay, some of them made it past the first room, some of it died in the first room, some get a few rooms in. But then once you're down, like, a couple levels, like, down into the dungeon, you start getting to the point where it's like, we've made it further than anyone else, which means we don't know what danger lies ahead. No one does. <laughs> you know? And that's the fear of the unknown. Right. So if you start to have, like, okay, well, we can see that, like, there's stuff, people have gotten this far, people have gotten this far less and less people have gotten this far oh no now we're the first ones to have gotten here which means that like this is the nastiest shit because no one has survived this far yet All right. that's a ter that's a terrifying feeling for a player and i think on that sinking pit that is where we'll leave dungeon discussion for now because yes that's very helpful and we do have one other topic to get to today, and that is part two of what we're doing with the class. Yes. So, yes. Um, getting back into it, we had previously discussed narrowing down the class's unique attributes, uh, balancing the class, and choosing a subclass that represents the most classiest version of that class that ever could exist in the class. <laughs> yeah, the most the most art art typical, you know. So, and where we had left off, we were talking about, I believe, we had just gotten to the avant garde and looking at how its uh, uh, extra features affect the class as a whole. So, let's just get back into the basic abilities real quick as a quick rundown before we go into it. We know that this is a spellcasting class based around utility like your bard. Um, spellcasting uses constitution. You're here to basically kind of be a utility pseudo tank for your your uh, allies, I should say. And I say pseudo because you're there to take attention away from other players. Maybe right. not necessarily by taking hits, but by relieving their stress. So, we know we got light armor, simple weapons, constitution wisdom, cook's tools, yada, yada, yada. 
And we have our magic table, which is using the Bard's magic table list. I believe we went through all of our abilities to make sure they're pretty equal out. And took out some things that are a little too busted. Like yeah. soul points, uh, we were going to get back to those after we looked at a few other things. But soul points are our main bread and butter with this class. It's the sorcery points or key points for this class. It's cool. how they do their special thing, which allows them to infuse meals so these meals can have additional effects. Now, um, let's let's take a quick because we kind of bounced around a little bit last time. Mm -hmm. So I want to actually start very beginning, like level one. Like the basic class features. So it's the Soothsayer. So you get, we were talking a, a D8 hit die. Yep. Which I think is good, a solid for any first bucket that's going to put at the same level as Druids, as Bards, as Clerics. I think that's good. D8, uh, so you get 8 plus Constitution mod for first level. Then we have D8 or 5 plus Con mod for two level after that. Good. And then you start them off with light armor, which I think is interesting. Um, uh, and simple weapons. Now, I know... Um, I like the light armor. What I'm wondering is, do we want to do light and medium? Or like light and shields? Or do we want to just stick with light? Because I feel like you could even give them... Um, medium, because consider like druids get light, medium, and shields. Mm -hmm. Um, I think bards. I have to double check. Um, bard proficiencies. I want to say they get light and medium. No, they just bards just get light. Yeah, and that's why I actually wanted to keep it with just light because bards do just get light. Um, I made this starting proficiency. I changed a bit, keeping in mind that the avant-garde is supposed to be the normal of this class. Um, yeah. This class does get its uh, cooking discipline or subclass at level one. It's one of the classes that get that at level one. And the way that I am trying to set up these uh, subclasses, when you choose your cooking discipline, typically you'll get some extra stuff. For example... Um, the other subclass, after the avant-garde, which would be your second choice, the Hearthstone, they're more defensive. So at level one, when you choose them, you're going to get proficiency with heavy armor. And they heavy get, armor. yeah, they'll get heavy armor and they'll get shields. Um, I can get into the Heart of Golden Seal later. We didn't touch that. But the idea is, if you're just going for the normal class, you're only going to get light armor because... I'm expecting you to be able to summon the Gourmet Golem. I think having medium armor with this Golem that can suck up, soak up a bunch of damage, that might be a little too powerful. And that's why I kept yeah. it to light. Because... Now, um, is there a reason for the arson that it's it goes straight from light to heavy? Or um, um, There is no reason. Medium could have been fine. I just put heavy because I was thinking they're the tankier version. So, that's more of, um, that's a holdover from how I originally designed the class and subclasses. So, okay. we can get to that later. Yeah, we'll burn that bridge when yeah, we get yeah. to it. Yeah, we'll burn that bridge when yeah. we get to it. That's why I just want, keeping in mind of this just basic functions, I wanted light. Because I believe having medium armor, knowing that you're eventually going to be able to summon a golem, which you should always have this golem up, that might be a little bit too powerful. You got the golem. Right. It can take hits for you. It, it can take a lot of that weight off of you. You have your amazing spells. And you're already a spellcaster wearing light armor. That's a big benefit with it itself. Right, right. And then um, I like um, simple weapons. Um, the only other thing I might add would be Simple weapons and um, maybe hand crossbows because I like to give people a nice um, 
that's a pretty common one is hand crossbows. It's not a, a have to. I just like it. No, I agree um, with that. I didn't know hand crossbows weren't a simple weapon. Uh, no, not technically. Yeah. I, I have to double check. Um, weapons. The breakdown is one of those like annoying ones. Um, uh, a light crossbow is a simple weapon. A hand crossbow is a martial ranged weapon. I see. Okay, so I'll just put hand crossbows in because I do not want them having martial. I think that's a little, yeah, a little too no, strong. I, I, you know, like there's stuff like bards get like long swords and rapiers, and I think like druids get like um, scimitars or something. Yeah, um, but like I, I think that simple weapons and hand crossbows are fine. Saving throws, I like con and wisdom, no issues there, you know, um, wisdom is a spell casting for it, so you want to have that straight at the gate, and then you want to have another thing that matters. Um, typically for saving throws for a class, I say you want to have um, a strong save and a weak save. Mm -hmm. um, a strong save is going to be something like um, dex, con, um, wisdom, you know, something like that. Um or, uh, yeah, like, um, excuse me, uh, yeah, Dex, Wisdom, um, Con, maybe, um, that's one of those, like, mid ones, but then, like, you want to have a weak save, which would be, like, Strength, Intelligence, mm -hmm. um, Charisma, because you want to have something that, um, uh, balances it out, so, like, a save that you don't make as often. Yeah. Um, but Wisdom and Con, I have no issues with that, I think that that's good. You know, you think of, like, a bard that gets, like, dex and charisma, a uh, druid that gets intelligence and wisdom. Um, I think that's fine. Cook's utensils, obvious. One of the tools of your choice. Great. Um, skills, three. Uh, three skills, so definitely a lot of utility there. Um, um, now, I'm tempted to take Arcana off, but I know they're a spellcaster, so that'd be stupid to take off. Um, well... Arcana is knowing magical, um, like knowing about magical creatures and spells and objects and things. If their focus is cooking, I don't know that Arcana is necessary. Yeah, and that's what I was thinking because, like, animal handling makes sense. Performance makes sense. Performance mm -hmm. is so broad. I wish performance wasn't as broad as it was, but it is what it is. What um, I might what I might say is like. Um, you could take Arcana off. We have Insight, History, Medicine, Nature. So a lot of Intelligence and Wisdom stuff there. Survival, Persuasion, Performance. So you got a couple of Charisma. Um, we don't have either of the body uh, skills. So I would say Athletics or, or Acrobatics might be a good one to toss in there. I would probably say Acrobatics. Um, but... That would be if you got rid of Arcana, you could like replace it with acrobatics, or or athletics. But I think even if you just got rid of Arcana, it'd be fine because you got a solid list of skills. Yeah, there. I just felt like Arcana was a little too much. I'll do athletics. I like that better because yeah, I, I like athletics. Athletics is better. I like that better, especially um, since some of the other classes are a little bit more hardy. So. Right. And I think Persuasion can go. I had it on there. But the more that I think about this class, the less I know if it fits. Thematically, I guess, is what I'm thinking of. You could get rid of Persuasion. What I might suggest in its place... Because um, I, I like the idea of, of a Charisma one. Um, it's like deception, persuasion, performance, um, but um, uh, sleight of hand would be the one that I would say. Oh um, yeah, if they want to do poisoning stuff, I gotcha. Sure, but you're also you're good with a knife. You mm -hmm. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, there you go. And um. Starting equipment, standard, simple weapon, adventurous pack. Um, I would say, why don't you do um, 
any simple weapon or a hand crossbow and 20 bolts. Cool. Any simple weapon. Boop, 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 boop. You just couldn't wait to be here today, couldn't you? You're so happy to be on screen. I know, you are a good cat, you are a good cat. I get it, here, here's a treat. Yeah. Go okay. to your tower, there you go. Adventurer's packs and cook's utensils. Um, and then just because this is the kind of person I am, I'm going to do this. Um, you do weapons, armor, and then you do uh, packs and tools. Yep. Um, and then um, you put 100 gold worth of rare ingredients. That's and a as I said, over. Yeah, they don't need that yeah, anymore. We're going to get rid of that. What I would say um, you could do there is either do... Because um, the, the third thing, or the fourth thing, is, is either going to be a second secondary pack or it'll be like another weapon option because this isn't a martial based class i would probably stick it to either just end it there or say um uh a second uh like a simple weapon or a a, a hand crossbow and 20 bolts yeah if you want to have two two hand crossbows or two simple weapons they can do that or one of each you know yeah we can just end it there because some of the subclasses will allow you to pick something extra if you're supposed to have it, so. Right. Starting equipment, I think that that's fine. All right. Now, we are here to our level and proficiency. I believe we had this set up. So, you just get soul points equal level. We yeah. Just need to... um, it's something that down the road, it's like when you do this formatted on like gm binder or something yeah this would be like, a lot easier to do we can add another table uh column that has soul points but we know it's equal to level you know yeah spells known i think that's fine two cantrips four spells and then you start getting a spell a level after that with a couple of boosts i think yep 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 following totally the hard table there. so mm -hmm. boop, 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 boop. um they end with one, one, two, two, three, three, four. Yep, standard. Um, with twenty-two spots. Spell casting wisdom. I think that that makes perfect sense for this. Um, you know, um, I could see, I could see the argument for charisma, but there's enough goddamn charisma casters. I think so many charisma casters. Wisdom or intelligence. Um, I would personally give it to wisdom. Because I think that that fits more into the idea of like loving what you cook as opposed to just knowing the ingredients. Yeah. Um, I chose wisdom because an intelligent man knows that a fruit, a tomato is a fruit. A wise man knows that a tomato doesn't go in the fruit salad. Now, charisma is being able to sell a tomato based fruit salad, though. Yeah, but that's what the bard does. Exactly. <laughs> um, so. Good, good. Um, spells at 8 plus uh, proficiency plus wisdom. Spell attack, proficiency plus wisdom. Spell casting focus. Um, so I would say, it says your cook's utensils are your focus for all your spells. I would put it um, a, for your spell casting focus, you can use a component pouch or cook's utensils. Um, uh, because you still want to give them the option if if they lose their utensils, then they can just get a a component pouch. Um, but we'll we'll consider that as like oh for them it's a bunch of ingredients. Mm -hmm. The nice thing is because they you know get a feature where they can like just grab ingredients. Yeah. You know from extra dimensional space like that's kind of they they thankfully can't really be without the ability to cast spells unless they're like in anti magic or some shit. But. Um, all their spells take a long time to cast, so that's the trade-off. So a, if they're captured, a smart villain will, you know, do something to secure their hands so they can't yeah. <laughs> uh, cast their spells. Um, uh, Multi-classing, um, I would say if we want to put prerequisites um, into multi-classing. I think that they should have a minimum 
13 wisdom um, to to multi-class into this, and they gain proficiency with light armor and simple weapons, and then cooks utensils. Yes. Do, you want me to, do you want me to type that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I have my Inquisitor class up, so I'm going to copy and paste and then change it to your thing. This is this is something that I think surprises a lot of people. I ooh. I actually am very lazy in my typing. I will copy paste something and then change it to fit what I want it to be. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. If it's written right, it's written right. Formality. If I write it once, then I'm done writing it. I'm gonna copy paste it again. Um. Must uh, me uh, so let's change this to uh, just wisdom thirteen. And then, um, when you must class in, into the Sioux class, you gain the following proficiency light armor, simple weapons, and uh, cooks you utensils. That's what utensils, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. And then we we're into soul points. We went over these already. Infused meals. They take effect when you eat them. Healing spells will go off immediately. Spells like mass cure wounds only affect the people that eat the food. Non enchantment yes. spells require so, area effect person needs. Yes. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. During a rest you during a rest you can prepare a meal for your allies. The number of soul points you have is equal to your character. It takes one soul point to infuse this spell into a meal. Infusing a meal, uh, so plus we spent the start of the rest, cover the end of a long rest. Hmm. Okay. Because um, the idea is you can only use these during a rest, is the idea. Because, like, it takes time to infuse a meal. Right. What I would say is if you. Um, it's like you can. We'll have to play with the wording of that a little bit because. <laughs> As worded, and we'll, like I said, we'll fix it, but as worded, we don't want it to be like, okay, I'll use five <laughs> soul points, like I'll use five soul points to Salsa. infuse this, and then at the end of the rest, I get those points back. It's like, no, no, you expended them over the rest to make the food, um, but you get the rest of your points back, you know? Um, because that just means infinite spell casting over, uh, over a rest. Which is not what we want. No. Um, I was just about to comment mm -hmm. about the tomato that salsa. <laughs> salsa. Yeah. Um, and then, so let's see here. Things but not enchantment spells targeted creatures. Rare effect requires to eat the food to make it easy. To um, again, I th think that's something that we changed. So that um, it's it's just your um, yeah we changed this one non enchantment yeah. spells da -da -da. no no we kept this one it used to be disadvantage we took the disadvantage out that's what it was this okay, is for yeah. yeah this is for like if you're giving them like the ability to cast fireball or like burning hands or something. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what, that's yeah, what. that's why I kept it safe because, like, the idea is they need to be able to stomach the spicy food they just ate. Right. Yep, yep, yep. No, this um, one's fine. Okay. Yep, that one made sense. Yeah, that's something we put the net go back because that's a complicated thing that we'll have to figure out the exact yeah, way to say it. Because um, a lot can happen with these spells. I mean, that's the fun of this class, is using these spells with your food, but it definitely needs to be worded carefully. You can yes. use a meal with a soothsayer spell from the Transmutation or Enchantment School. When you do so, unwitting creature eats the meal's penalty the same to equal to your proficiency bonus. A suspicious creature can make an inside check against your spell save, determining it's been magic alter on success. Does not register to detect magic or similar spells. So that, yeah, that was something that we did. I like that. Yeah. Um, now, um, okay, so moving ahead, we have the pocket pantry, magical door, um, 
Unlimited number of rations of groceries, only source food and drinks. It can hold anything that's necessary: drinkable liquid, uh, potable food, not eatable, potable, potable food. To the guest's knowledge, food and drink doesn't spoil or age while in the pantry. All spells in the sink. Grocery sector, but most basic ingredients are free. Things. Um, that's flavor that we might change here. Yeah. Um, but uh, the spell requires material components to gold cost. You can simply offer the gold to the actual assistant within your pocket pantry. Place material components with a value equal to 100 times your person's bonus. Um, at 10th level, it's 1,000 times. So yeah, that we liked because what that means is if I have the gold, I can just cast the spell, which is really a very nice feature of this class. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because if I'm like, oh, I want to do shape change, I need a 1,500 gold jade circlet. It's like, cool, now i got to find a fucking merchant selling that or go to some blacksmith who can make it. Oh, that's why I meant to add. Uh, I didn't meant to add the restriction that you can only use the pocket pantry during your rest. During what? During your rest. Hmm. Since it's like it, it's kind of like it has to be ritually. It's a ritual cast. Is uh, I guess is a better way to put it. I would say then to open to access it or something. It's it takes a minute to access it, or it takes ten minutes is too rough. I'd say like it takes a minute to access it because you want them to still be able to access it whenever they want. If they're like. Let's say I'm out in the desert and I find some guy who's like, like, passed out. And I'm like, oh, I want to give him water. Yeah, I can still do that. But if it's like, in the middle of combat, I can't just be like, Boop. it's yeah. the point of this this class is spell casting outside of combat and then having those as like usable things during combat. Okay, cool. That's the answer then. Because yeah, why why I went back over and looked at it later, I was just like, wait. Technically, the way this is worded, they could just go around during combat. That goes in the pantry. That goes in the pantry. That goes in the pantry. I'm like, oh, 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 oh no, don't do that. No, no, I would say accessing the pantry um, uh, takes a minute or something, you know. Yeah. Uh, over the course of a minute, a soothsayer can uh, open a extra planar door to... Or it can open a magical door to an extra planar uh, pantry. Over the course. Somebody said. Yeah. At first level, this area have access to a magical door that leads to two planes possible pantry over the course of a minute. Let's let's, let's reword that. Let's, let's reword, reword it. That. So, at first level, um, at first level, so well, actually. So, there's have access to um, ingredients at all times. So we want to do like flavor, and then mm -hmm. we say mechanically. Over the course of a minute, you can access a magical door to an extra planar space. Um, which contains um, uh, um, let's see here a magical assistant who can retrieve items for you um and then let's um let's get rid of this okay um because that just says the same exact thing um it can hold an unlimited number of rations and groceries but only stores um only stores food and drinks um this line we can get rid of. Um, or how about we say anything um, other than a uh, liquid or potable food stuff 
potable food um, uh, instantly is pushed out of the uh, pantry. Cool. And this is what do we call it? The pocket pantry. Mm -hmm. uh, an extra player space um, called a pocket pantry. I was um, thinking what. There we go. Yeah. When I was done with this, I was thinking of doing a fun little one shot of just uh, a party has to go inside the pocket pantry to clean it out. Sure. I played a um, a construct with that was a Warforged made out of an old fridge named mm -hmm. Freon, and he was a maniac. Um, but he was basically an old fridge. Yeah. That was cool. Yeah. The idea was like doing it kind of like a mini backstory to introduce you to the class and like the people that teach the class like because I'm still running with the idea that like a lot of the way that this class got made is through the help of uh, Alec since he's one of the few sorcerers that actually was around before you know magic got fucked over so the idea is just like, Souffle's like, yeah, I need to clean up this uh, spot here. I'm not doing it. You can do it. <laughs> Some um, idiot sorcerer put something in there that shouldn't be in there, and it's eating everyone's food. But that's a side topic. Um, anyway, back to the pantry. Can I eat this is flavor. That is all flavor. Yeah. That is all um, for fun flavor. It will be looked at later. So yeah, that's that's something that what I think we should do because there is really cool stuff there. Is like, oh yeah, when you put something into the pocket pantry, or like if you do like over the course of you know whatever like a minute, you can take a creature and it can be broken down into. Um, like, with a successful check, like, you know, equal to their CR mm -hmm. or some shit, like, uh, or, you know, whatever, like, ingredients that are worth a certain amount of components value. Yeah. I like that idea, but it's like, that is something that really needs to be... Yeah, it needs to be looked uh, at. ...fine-tuned, because it, it could get out of hand fast. And a really combat-heavy campaign that gives you a lot of stuff, but in something where you're not dealing with a lot of monsters, then it can really weaken the guy. So we don't want to make it dependent on that. We want it to be a ribbon yeah. that just gives them more flavor. Um, Renewed Vigor is a key ability. They literally need it. Uh, it's the thing that basically boosts their soul points. Mm -hmm. So, um, basically lets them get an extra two soul points when this uh, class act trait activates and they get extra two at level 11. Just as a little flavor boost. The biggest thing it does is lets them get soul points back on a short rest. Yeah, that's something that I think if we even put like, oh, up to this point, it's like you get soul points back on a long rest. And then like here, it's like you get soul points on a short or long rest. Or like, um, uh, you know, you can make something over the course of a short rest once uh, without expending soul points. Yeah. Well, you know? that's leftovers. That, that right. was a later thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leftovers is a later ability because of how powerful we deemed it was going that's to right. be. That's right. That's what we said. Yeah. Um, the main purpose of Renew Vigor is just a short rest in an extra two soul points at level 5 and 11. I think mm -hmm. it, 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 it it's where it needs to be. Lunchbox is a key ability of theirs. So, that's literally the main way they're going to be making infused meals, probably, is a lunchbox. I would imagine. Yeah. Um, as an action, you create a lunchbox by expending a soul point. A creature can eat a lunchbox as an action. We're getting one to eat hit points instantly. Does not spoil, but a creature cannot carry more than one lunchbox at a time. You can infuse it as you would a meal. You do so, it expires 24 hours after infusing it, but it no longer counts against the number of lunchboxes a creature can hold. And the healing loss was a 2d8, 15 goes to 3d8. Yeah, yeah, really liked that. And this is one thing I was I, I wanted to question. So, you think it's fine if they hold more than one lunchbox? Because I thought that was powerful. Um, 
What level do we say Lunchbox is? Lunchbox, um, because it, I believe it's Se third. Second. Third. Is it second or third? Third. They don't get Lunchbox to level three. Okay, we need to say that. Yeah. Um, oh, I can take Spice of Life off. We took that out completely. That no longer exists. That was too powerful. Yeah, I believe Spice of Life is completely gone. Yeah, it's not. That's the one you said wasn't necessary because they get spells, right? Because right. it's yeah. yeah. Um. So ba 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 ba. Yeah, yeah. Since they don't have Spice of Life, then that's perfectly fine. Then. And then Pocket Pantry is first level. Yep, yeah, Pocket Pantry is first level. First level, they get Pocket Pantry soul points and their cooking discipline. We're just gonna say cooking discipline. And, and, um, and then pocket pantry. Let's get rid of souffles. We're just going to say pocket pantry. Spellcasting, which should be one word. Um, we're going to we're gonna kill this link. Thank you. Spellcasting, soul points. Um, Cooking discipline, pocket pantry. Second level... Um, is when they get uh, nothing. Uh, third level, um, they get can I eat this and lunchbox. Yes. Yep. And lunchbox is really the big thing. Can I eat this? It's on the chopping block. It can easily be replaced. Well, can I eat this? Can stay. It can just be rewarded. Can I eat this? I think should be added as part of pocket pantry. And what I mean is, I would make it something that, as part of Pocket Pantry, you can say, like, when you kill it, like, once a day, you can mm -hmm. try and break down a creature into your Pocket Pantry. Um, you get, like, a number of components equal to something if you do whatever. I don't know that I would gate it behind a check. I might even do something like, you gain a, a number of mm -hmm. groceries equal to this you know yeah like but we'll 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 burn that bridge when we get to it um expertise um yeah fine with that um same as a bard or a rogue because mm -hmm. cool. they're meant to be a sp skill monkey mm -hmm. leftovers at 10th level or longer so you can <laughs> from a two million you've made send the magic effect of one meal for one partner with without expending a spell slot. Mm -hmm. uh, so compared to twice as seventy well tenth level you know how to prepare hearty dishes from the leavings of previous meals. You can choose one infused meal, spell fifth level or lower. Extend the time it lasts before spoiling by twenty four hours. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you can extend spend two infused meals. Perfect. And then we talked about signature dish. And it's um, a, a possible option. Yeah. Um, so I really like that. Let's take another look at... I wonder if we can transfer what we have here to GM Binder. I might do that for you after this. Um, just so it looks a little nicer. We can start formatting this properly. Um... Signature dish, okay, uh, cooking dish. So avant-garde, that's the one that gives you the gourmet gold. Mm -hmm. um, and I like the spells. So fireball, frostbite, acid splash, gas bolt, frost fingers, Tasha's caustic brew. Frost fingers is the only one that I'm kind of iffy on. Yeah, and these are all options. We can get to that if you want to go over the spell list because I ha it has a spell list now. That was going through a little bit. Let's but do that. I didn't because I had just started going through the spell list to decide. Because obviously, I don't want this class to have a lot of offensive spells. So, um, if you go to the bottom right here, I just started simple before I got too deep into fourth and beyond. I just started at stopped at third level just to see if I had a good feel. So, 
Let's I, let's start with cantrips. We got control frames, create bonfire, dancing lights, and code thoughts, guidance, gust, light, mending, produce flame, shape water, and press the digitation. Okay, so let's look at that for a second. Now the cantrips, these ones they can cast in and out of combat, you know, using their cook utensils, because they're cantrips. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's think for a second. Control flames uh, make sense. Fun. Um, create bonfire. Let me think about create bonfire. Because I kind of like the idea of that. Um, yeah. Because, like, create bonfire just makes sense. It's like, yeah, like, you're cooking. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah. Great bumper. And some very lights. Okay. Encode thoughts. No. Uh, you don't think, think so? Encode, well, encode thoughts. That's a Ravnica one. Um. And I think that like. It's cool, but it, like affecting like memories into your mind, and it's like that's a cool. But I'm trying to think of how that would fit in for a chef. Um, the thought process I had with encode thoughts was literally going for that thing, like when you're cooking and you just, hey, I need this. Hey, I need this. Like when you're in the zone and you're just telling people, I need this. I need this. It was meant to represent that unspoken. Um, cook code that cooks use when they talk to each other. So I I wanted it to be like a kind of like magical telepathy, you know, like if you yeah. walked into a kitchen with all Seuss Seuss's cooking, there wouldn't be any word. They're just straight. Hey, I need this. Hey, I need this. Hey, I need this. Hey, I, I need this. I think you'd be better doing message instead of encode thoughts. Okay, cool. We'll do that. Message is SRD firstly, which is always a bonus, but also, um. I think if it's a matter of uh, quick communication, message is the best way to go. Cool. Um, guidance, because obviously guidance, yeah, guidance. is that. <laughs> um, yeah. Gust, for the same reason as control frames create bronze fire, just the idea of, oh, it's a cook, he wants to put out a fire, quick gust. Mm -hmm. um, um, light, mending. Um, I don't think you need control flames to create buffer and produce flame. I think you should have two of those, not all three. Okay. So I would either say control flames and produce flame, or create bonfire and produce flame. Let's do uh, produce flame and take out control flames. Okay. That way, because control flames at least gives them a offensive option if they didn't choose avant-garde, because that's literally, I think, that and bonfire are the only two cantrips they could use as an offense. And I don't want that to be a big feature of the class, but it's right. unfun for a spellcaster to have any kind of damaging cantrip. Right. And right. that's what Create Bonfire or Control Flame would be. They don't really scale well. They're not big damage dealers. Um, shape Water makes sense. Precision, obviously. The, um, the only other one that I could see would be um, Mage Hand. Mage Hand? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll get, I can get behind that. I was um, on the fence with Mage Hand. Because it's like, oh, I need to get that. And then yeah. just Mage Hand it over. If, if chefs could have Mage Hand, the world would be a better place. You know what I mean? If anyone could have Mage Hand, the world would be a better place. Oh, my God. Jesus. Look, let's... Oh, man. Um... First level, I had a lot easier hand with time with. Absorb elements just seemed to make sense. It's very defensive, good. Alarm made sense. Burning hands made sense to me. Uh, bless, uh, that can come or go, but I just kind of, it's food. I just thought that kind of made sense. It was thematically appropriate. Bless, bless is good. The thing is, since it targets multiple creatures, um... We want to make sure that stuff like that, there are options for them to cast it. 
So like who eats the food can cast the spell so they can target. We want to make sure that it, it affects every because bless only affecting one person kind of sucks. We, mm -hmm. The point is that it affects three people or more. But that's something we're still playing with this spell yeah. casting. So. Well, also bless is also was on there keeping in mind uh, of this other ability. Because I know, like, Bless can only affect one person, but uh, the other uh, chef that I want to go into, the more defensive one, Bless is very good for them. Ooh, ba -ba 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 -ba. If you go up to the Hearthstone, their special uh, Golden Graham, their special lunchbox. Is that something that we want to give that subclass then as an expanded spell? Um, that might be better. That was definitely an option for it because they have more clericy spells. So I would definitely be down for that one. That is that was one I definitely wanted to question on because the way that Golden Graham is supposed to work is your baked goods are better than the rest. When you make a lunch box, you explain the soul point to create up to four lunch boxes instead of just one. Therefore, when they use bless, all four of those lunch boxes could have bless on them. Okay. Then, yeah, so what I would say then is, and I'd probably, it's a number of lunchboxes equal to your proficiency bonus is how I would do it. So yeah. I'm just throwing that out there, but we'll get ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Let's take Bless off of the main spell list and give it exclusively to Hearthstone. Okay, I will put that on them. Um, and then... Um, comprehend languages that's kind of a fun one mm -hmm. something that you can then like understand any language that's kind of fun greater destroy water perfect cure wounds great uh, detect poison and disease of course that's kind of funny that you'd eat something so you could see if something's poisoned um, yeah. also it's so, one of those things too like I'd imagine they could just do it on normal food if they wanted to of, of course right um, Dissonant Whispers is an interesting one. Um, that was a... I, I thought it'd be fun, but that was a take-it-or-leave-it one. Just the idea of, like, I was sitting there like, oh, what if you did eat something that gave you a little... Yeah. <laughs> I've had some times where I've... I... Like... Yeah, the other day I had some curry that gave me some Dissonant Whispers, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, extra Street, False Life, Feather Fall, Fall Cleric... Gift of Alacrity. We gotta get rid of Gift of Alacrity. Um, it's a good spell, but that's a um, that's not SRD. Um, that's a, a Tunamancy spell. Mm -hmm. uh, good Berry, obviously. Yeah. Grease, Hellish Rebuke. Fogclad and Hellish Rebuke were in there for the same thematic reason, if you get what I'm saying. Yes, I get exactly what you're saying. Um, I'm just wondering for Hellish Rebuke mechanically how that would work. I don't know that reaction spells are necessarily... I think I worded it so um, Hellish Rebuke will work like the other ones. You have a charge of it. So, sure. yeah, because it's one of the ones when you get it, you you should get a charge of it. Um... Okay. So that, that yes. way, yeah, yeah. Someone hits you. Oh, uh, I got a charge of Hellish Rebuke. I'll blow up. Illustrate script, no, but I would do identify. Okay. Um, there's there's no one that's going to be like, oh, yeah, I'll do all the effort just so they can cast a illusory script. You know what I mean? That's like a wizard does that, or that's one of those like DM spells that like it's in there so that DMs can use it, but like players, it's like illusory script sucks. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's why that pin exists. Uh, exactly. Jump, uh, Long Strider, obviously, they're buffs. Uh, Magnify Gravity, that's another Dunamancy. I'd suggest. I like it a lot, but I would suggest no. Okay. Um, protection from evil and good. I'm thinking about taking that off and just giving it straight to. Uh, Let's let's get rid of bless and protection from evil and good and give those. Actually, no. Let's get rid of bless. Let's keep protection from evil and good. Okay. 
Because if it's like, we're going to deal with some zombies, here, eat this. And they're like, all right, cool. Yeah, yeah. Or the same way I think of, um, okay, l- let me preface this. Fuck turfs. J.K. Rowling can die in a fire. But um, in Harry Potter, when they have, like, the Dementors, it's like, here, make sure you have chocolate because you need to, like, eat this. Like, if they try to fuck you up, like, eating chocolate will make you feel better. I got That's you. kind of what I think of from Protection Evil and Good. Okay, yeah, yeah, I can see that. But fuck turfs. Fucking J.K. Rowling. Um, anyway, Purify, that's a whole... I don't want to go off on a tangent, but... <laughs> yeah. Fuck her forever for her stupid-ass opinions. Uh, purify food and drink, great. Sleep, great. Um, do we want to toss... Um, and this is... this is If we have Hellish Rebuke, I feel like Silvery Barbs is, is another fair one. Um, Silvery Barbs, I'm fine with. I don't want to give it to all of them, though. I'd say okay. let's give that to the avant-garde. Okay. So I will add um, that up there. Just because, like, that's very spellcastery, you know? Right. And I want, like, if you're the avant guard, you're here to be more of a spellcaster, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll um, take off Frost Fingers, actually, and give it Silvery Barbs. Slamming! Um, speak of animals, Thunder Wave. Thunder Wave is a funny one. Um, behold my thunderous thought. Um,. I mean, that's how it's going to be flavored every time. Oh, that's exactly why it's fair. Like, yeah. like so... Last hideous laughter. Is that a first level? Is hideous, is hideous laughter a first level? I'm pretty sure it is, yeah. I believe you. And... That was just like, oh, yeah, you ate some... That was really... You can't stop laughing because of what you ate today. Tasha's hideous <laughs> laughter is actually a magic card too. That's fun. I love that. Yeah. Okay. It is first level. I don't know why I would doubt myself. Um, Zephyr Strike is an interesting one. It can I would add, stay or um, leave. Actually, I'm taking Zephyr Strike off. That goes to a different class I want to do later. So I'm just going to take okay. that off because I had a I had an idea for that, and we can get to that later. That is going to be literally the last class. So. Okay, but you need to add Unseen Servant. Gotta have Unseen Serpent in there. If I can create a extra dimensional space with a magic uh, invisible assistant, then I better be able to have an Unseen Serpent. Um, what do you think? I was going to give them uh, the access to Tiny Hut, but I was on the fence of that one. No. Because when I think mechanically, I go through the effort to make a Tiny Hut food, and then I do Tiny Hut... Then immediately get, it's like it starts to become redundant. Yeah, I, I no, and, no tiny hut. And like I said, some of these I'm thinking of too. A, they can't just cast spells as normal. Does he want to just cast tiny hut? Is this a spell for infusion or just for that? So, um, okay, um, yeah, I still think like they should be able to cast normally. But you can infuse meals so that you can have stuff pre-prepared, like making your own spell scrolls on the go. Focus on that more than normal casting. I can right. get down with that. That's but and having spells in just combat is you you want to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, but we'll like I said, the spell we'll, should be focused more on what their main goal is, not on the fact that it'd be useful if you could do this too. Yeah, but no, Tony. All right. So, um, third level, Alter Self obviously makes sense. Bark Skin, Beast Sense, Blindness, Deafness, Blurred. They're getting a lot of these, you know, enchantment ones. Calm Emotions, Continual Flame, I thought made sense. Crown of Madness, because um, that's just fun. I don't know about Borrowed Knowledge. Okay. Um, again, Borrowed Knowledge, that's a... That's a Strixhaven one. Well, actually, no. You know what? Keep our knowledge, because that's like reading a, a, a cookbook. That's fine. Uh, Beast Sense. Beast Sense? Okay. Beast Sense. Um, blind Deceptiveness. Blur. I like Blur. Common Motions. Can you find Crown of Madness? Detect Thoughts. Did we do Detect Magic for first level? Yes. No, no, no. It's not there. So no Detect Thoughts. Let's take that off. 
Um, I like the idea of like eating something and be able to detect someone's thoughts, but let's leave that to the bard territory, actually. Yeah, let's get rid of detect thoughts, but first level, we need to have detect magic. Oh, yeah, because they're a spellcaster. Yeah. Um... Detect? That's not how you... Can you can you spell today? Detect? Really? It's cool, it's cool, it's cool. It's... May! <laughs> May! <laughs> anyway. Uh, okay. Uh, Dragon's Breath, good. Enhance ability, enlarge, reduce, good. Enthrall. I like Enthrall. Gentle Repose. Um... The uh, Gift of Gab. That's a, um... A Penny Arcade one. Get rid of Gift of Gab. Got it. Um. Um. Heat Metal, whole person. That's all good. Uh. That's Restoration. Look at. Le oh, Levitate. Yeah, Levitate's third level. Um. I don't know why I'm doubting myself. Is it? No, second level. What am I doing? Um, okay, animals or plants. Um, gotta have magic weapon. Um, you think they should all have magic weapon then? Okay. Mm -hmm. That was one of those other ones I was on the fence of just making exclusive to, uh, subclass. You still got to give it to somebody else. And okay. Or like do the. I think magic weapon is fine. Um, mirror image protection from poison. Um, pyrotechnics. See invisibility. Um, what if instead of pyrotechnics? Because that's. Um, what if I said pyrotechnic? Well, actually, no. It's good to keep some transmutation. I was going to say Scorching Ray. Um, yeah, I, Scorching Ray's cool, but I'm pretty sure I gave that to... Yeah, they have it. it that's just Avantgarde. Avantgarde has Scorching Ray. Okay. Um, they get it at third level. Well, when, uh, they get their, at, when they get their third level spells or whatever, you know. Right, right. They um they get uh as a Ang ah Agazar Scorcher Melf Acid Arrow and Scorching Ray. Okay, again Azar is and a, it, thank you. It's one of the hardest ones to pronounce. So I, it's again Azar. It's a rough one. Um, now I'm gonna run. Firstly, you gotta have Web on there for second level. Um, but what if? You did um, a spiritual weapon. Oh, not bad. I think if it, I think if it is, you have the unseen servant. You have this. It's almost like having uh, your own sous chef. Okay, I could, I could see that. I like that. That's not, that's fun. And that's something that like they can defend themselves. They can have an extra weapon in combat, but it's like. You're never gonna be doing the most damage with spiritual weapon. Like yeah. it's nice, but it's it's like okay, a a D eight, you know, as a bonus action, it's not unreasonable. Like it's you know. Plus, someone could fun. say a ladle's hitting people in the head. That's fun. Exactly. Um, third level. Um, oh, catnap is a good one. Yeah, this is where I started to get a little uncomfortable because I was like, okay, wait a second, am I picking bad spells now? So. Okay, so firstly, we're going to do Bestow Curse. Be you still. Um, bestow Curse. Catnap. Does this show my edits? Mm hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking. Catnap. Clairvoyance. Yeah, well, Clairvoyance. Um. Yeah, that's fine. Um, create food and water, obviously. Yeah. It'd be kind of funny um, if they couldn't, right? Right. Uh, fast Friends, uh, no, that's another um, Penny Arcade one. 
Um, Penny Arcade came up with some good spells. I didn't know that was that one too. Yeah. Um, but let's let's replace that with um, um, shit. I just had it. Uh, enemies abound. Enemies abound. I'm not familiar with that one. So enemies abound. Um, uh, I'll put it. Uh, but uh, you reach into the mind of a creature. You can see within 120 feet. Um, enemies. Oh, bad. Uh, they have to make an intelligence save. Oh, yeah. I just looked uh, at that. Yeah. On failure, they lose the ability to distinguish friend from foe. Oh, so shit. You, yeah. You eat You eat some bad shit, and you're like, oh, like you just Yeah, that's perfect, actually. Out. Um, enemies bound. Fear. Flame arrows. Flame arrow. That should be a spell class specific. Um, I would rather give them elemental weapon than flame arrows. Okay. So I'll take flame arrows and lightning arrows off. Yeah. Elemental weapon will cover all of that. Um, and you can kind of fit it into... It's more useful, I think, to do elemental weapon. Fits in the utility better. Um, fear, fly... Fly. Yes, fly. Um, gaseous form, of course. Haste. Hypnotic pattern. Yeah, they get all the gas ones. Right, right, of course. Um, insight greed is a penny arcade. Um, intellect fortress. Yeah. Uh, Limit's tiny hut. No. Um, said no. no. To that one. Um, plant growth. Plant growth. I like plant growth. Yeah. It protects from energy. It, if someone wants to be like, oh, my food's organic, man. All right, there you go. Have plant growth. Yeah, you know I mean, like. Remove curve. Yeah, revive slow. Spirit shroud. Hmm. I thought it could be like a fun little buff. I. I think it should either be spirit guardians. Or, um, I think it should be Spirit Guardians. Because Spirit Shroud is a necromancy, which I don't think is fitting, but it's also prevents them from, like, regaining hit points. Does it, like, I think Spirit Guardians, especially being in action, fits a little bit better. Um... Yeah. Tongues is obviously you need to eat this food. We can all talk to people who we need to. Because the thing is, the reason I say Spirit Guardian says Spirit Shroud, Spirit Shroud, you still have to go and hit them. Mm -hmm. Which I don't think is the point of this class. No. Um, stinking Cloud. Stinking Cloud. Um, tongues. Great water breathing. Water walk. Um, um, do we want to do Wall of Water? Uh, I didn't want to, I was on the fence of that one, personally, I, I wasn't sure. If I was going to do Wall of Water, I may have just given it to the Avant Guard as their special thing. Okay, well, let's... It, 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 just because, like, that's one of those things, it's a very powerful spellcasting ability. And not yeah. all of them are spellcasting. Okay, now let's look at um, uh, fourth level spells. All right, yeah, this is where I was just like, okay, I don't trust myself to pick something that, like, I, I realized quickly after I got out third level, I was like, okay, the spells that you're getting at fourth level and beyond can do a lot to change the course of a game. Right. Um, so... Uh, hold on. Okay. I don't know what I did. No, no, no. You're fine. You're fine. Uh, uh, Carly was letting me know that she is taking Cherry her dice. So she will be nice. happy. She will be very happy to see her Cherry dice. They're pretty. So, uh, Blight 
is a is one of the few damage ones we got to give this like are you sure okay damage because the thing is even look even bards get like shatter you know what i mean like yeah 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 you, you gotta have a couple of damage ones blight fits so well because it's just like here you go here's some poison disease food and it's just like Bleh. okay you know? okay um blight um obviously charm moss Charm, mar charm, mar ah, charm, monster, compulsion, confusion. I was thinking they just—you're eating food that's messing your brain up. I like the. Uh, I was. I. I don't know about charm monster. Really? Because I thought it would be fun to like if they're fighting. It, it, it's one of those things. Of like, oh, instead of fighting this uh, Umber Hulk, let's. Hey, buddy, do you want some food? Are you cool with this? You know. Okay, let's do Charm Monster. Um, I just, those three I thought gave them some fun options for like, you know, with their food. Charm Monster and Confusion, but I don't like Compulsion. Yeah. Because it just makes them move horizontally from you. I don't think that food-wise that that's something that fits in. Okay. And I definitely Charming choose someone with food or like confusing them with food. Sure, mm -hmm. but and I definitely choose charm monster over dominate beast because like it... charm monster just fits more flavor fav flavorly than dominate beast. You know. Yeah. Um, Death Lord. I think makes sense. Okay. Um, fabricate. Of course. You can cook stuff, like, why wouldn't you be able to defabricate? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Ooh. Oh, Fire Shield. That's definitely one that goes straight to the avant-garde. No one else gets that one. A little powerful. Let's do right Freedom of Movement. Um. In fact, I'm going to take off Minute Meteor for Fire Shield. That makes more sense. I was always on the fence of giving them a minute meteor. I like Fire Shield better. For the uh, avant garde, I mean. Right. Um. Um. Okay, freedom of movement. Um. I consider grasping vine, but I don't know about that. Um. I mean, they have invisibility already. Do you think greater invisibility is fine? Yes, greater okay. invisibility. Um, Polymorph was the obvious one. That's on there. Yes. Um, the other one I want to think about... No, I don't think Hallucinatory Terrain. Mm-mm. Uh, Limit Secret Chest. Um, that makes sense because you basically do that. Oh, uh, it does? Okay. Yeah, if if I can make a pocket pantry, I should be able to make a secret chest that anyone can use. Okay. Um, Stone skin, obviously. Uh, yes. Polymorph. Um. Ooh. I'm wondering if sickening radiance. No. No. Let's that, do. That's um, too. I feel like that's a little too offensive. That's too much damage. Um, da, 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 uh, Vitriolic Sphere. That's a really nasty spell, but it's like, it's a big acid spell. Not a lot of stuff gets to use that. No. No. Ooh, Watery Sphere, actually. I'm fine with them having Watery Sphere. Watery Sphere. Yeah. I like. I like Watery Sphere. Like, um, if I did vitriolic sphere, that would be just for avant garde. And then, I mean, if they can do watery sphere, yeah. In fact, I'll do that. I like that better. I'll take. I'll, I'll do vitriolic sphere for avant garde instead of. Because uh, what did I give them? Lightning bolt. That's better than lightning bolt. Yeah, lightning bolt doesn't make as much sense as vitriolic sphere. Then Wall of Fire is one that I keep going back to. They can't get it. <laughs> it's too much. 
The Wall of Fire is like, when I think Wall of Fire, as much as I think it'd be cool for this class to use it, I'm like, yeah, but that's that's like the wizard of withered spells when I think of withered spells. I know that's just me thinking of like classic D&D, but when I think Wall of Fire, I think of a, tr a traditional wizard casting that. Just because how devastating it is. Yeah. And plus, like, okay. they're cooks. They're about cooking with fire. Not like, oh my god, the fire, you know? Like, I yeah. I, I explain away Fireball for the avant-garde as if he is purposely making too big of a fire and he's tossing it at you, you know? Fireball right. is as reckless with fire as I think this class would ever get, though. All right. Uh, fifth level spells. Um... Firstly, uh, uh, Awaken. Oh, yeah, it makes Media sense. Media one I think of. Um, Bigby's Hand. Yeah. If, you can do, if you can do Mage Hand and Spiritual Weapon, you should be able to use Bigby's Hand. Uh, cloud Kill. They have to have Cloud Kill. Cloud Kill, of course. Um... Um, do we want to do commune? Hmm. I say no. Because it's specific, specifically a DD or divine proxy. I mean, that's why I say no. Consider commune with nature. I'd say neither of the communes. Yeah, d divination doesn't seem to be the same. No, like, um, I was hesitant with some divination spells, and I only wanted those that make, that makes makes more sense of... You didn't necessarily get new knowledge, you just thought better. You know what I mean? And that's right. why, like, some of the other ones made sense. But, like, once you get into communes and divinations and stuff, at that point in time, you're asking for a connection that these guys just wouldn't have. Um, we have to do creation... The other one I'm thinking is, I, th I think that one of the subclasses should get contagion. I don't think everyone should get it, but I think like the most offense uh, focused one should get contagion. I will put contagion on because it's a touch spell, correct? Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna put contagion on the uh head chef then okay because they are the one that will they're the one that wants to be in melee range the most and they're offensive melee range uh spell evil and good yes dominate person uh i think dominate person would be a good one eat some fucked up stuff and you can like tell somebody to do stuff for you yeah um it's up to you but no, I'm, I, dominate person. Dominate person makes more sense than dominate creature. Okay. Because so like, dominate person. yeah, at that point in time, it's a living, thinking person. You you made them think about eating the food and all that. Um, dream. Dream is kind of a fun one. Oh yeah, dream for sure. Yeah, eat this can't um, drink this chamomile tea. Um. Let's see here. Oh, innervation? No, not innervation. Um. Uh, well, we gotta do Gash. Um. Okay, Gash, Greater Restoration, of course. Um. You have Hold Person, right? So we gotta do Hold Monster. Um, um, and then we have elemental weapon and magic weapon. Um, holy weapon. Uh, I'm going to say I think it should be. There's a, another one at like seventh level that yeah. is like, yeah. I'm fine with holy weapon just being straight for the Hearthstone too. Okay, because they already they already get bless. Um. Immolation, no. Um, insect plague, no. Legend lore, no. Yeah, I'll, 
Mass cure wounds, maelstrom, mislead, none of that's needed. Um, modify memory well, is fun. Do you think mass cure wounds? Uh, mass cure wounds is uh, going to be for Hearthstone. Okay, make sure we're limiting it to two per spell level from one through fifth. From one through fifth, two per spell level? Yeah, because I know some of the things in Hearthstone I would just want to take off to make them clearly the more cleric version. Yeah. So. Um. Um. Well, no, yeah, all of them should have mass cure wounds. You're right. Okay, mass cure wounds. Yeah, yeah, because that's right. Hearthstone gets mass, gets healing word. That's the thing that helps them out. They get healing word along with cure wounds. So. Okay. Um. Gotta do modify memory. Pass wall. You think? Mm-hmm. I think that's fun. I like the idea of you, you know, especially I, it's a fun flavor of, yeah, you ate a gummy made from a gelatinous cube. So now you're all a little, little jelly you can pass through stuff. Or, you know, you you ate literally some ghost cakes. Uh, all right. I mean, pass wall literally, it creates a, a like an opening. Like oh, door. I'm thinking of something different. No, no, not pass wall. Not pass. Yeah, that's the one that creates it. It's like gaseous form. It lets you like, yeah. move through openings. I, pass, I, I always get pass wall in my head because I hear pass wall and I think Kitty Pride. <laughs> not the same spell. At um, all. <laughs> but. Okay, rare is telepathic bonds. Yeah. Yes. Um. Re b -b 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 they don't get reincarnate. No, that's the one I would figure instead of resurrection. Oh, is it, you think uh, reincarnate makes better, more sense than resurrection? Um, it depends if you want to be more like clerics or more like druids. Um, I was gonna go resurrection. Okay. So we'll we'll hold off then. Yeah, yeah. I was I was just literally going to go resurrection instead of reincarnate because like it make reincarnate could turn you into something different, you know. Right now, I will say the fifth level version we we got to either do raise dead or reincarnate. So raise dead. Yeah, we'll do raise dead. Because like I like the idea of r raise dead. Definitely can makes more sense leading into reincarn uh, re resurrection because like reincarnate you can change them to something different raise dead I like the idea of you're close you almost made the meal that could bring someone back to life but it wasn't quite why you know right um so raise dead they don't get any summons uh skill empowerment definitely yeah that makes sense um. Um. Oh, temporal shunt. I forget that's a spell. That's a fun spell. Temporal shunt. Yeah, that's all right. Um, I think that's fine. Well, transmute rock. Nah. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Uh, six level. And again, well, these will probably change. You know, but it's good to at least get the bases. Uh, um, we might even get rid of some of these. You know, um, as I said. But, um, six level, okay. Um. Ooh. Uh, let's see here. Now, six level and on is where the spell lists usually, like, drop off quite a bit. Um. Yeah, they only get, like, one or two from these, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, like, as far as the actual list, it's it's a, usually a much shorter list. You can see, like, the... First, second, and third level is like a, a lot of spells, and fourth and fifth it like drops off, and then like becomes a lot less after that. Um, now, Dramesia's instant summons um, definitely that one. Just like you have like a pastry in your hand, and then you crush it, and it becomes a sword. Like, come on. Mm. Um, that's something that is a utility spell that, like, is so useful. Like, I, I can't tell you. God. What do you think about Fine Path? 
because that's one of those other ones. It's not like something's telling you. It's just it's literally like, oh, I want to go north. I don't. Yeah, I don't mind find the path. Yeah, I like find the path. Um, uh, the stone. I think is is perfect. Turn someone to stone with your food. Mm -hmm. Um. Then let's see here. Um. Heroes feast. Yeah, they have uh, to have obviously. heroes feast. You'd be ashamed if they couldn't do that. Um. Ooh, the investiture could be really interesting. Oh, investiture of stone, wind, and stuff like that. Those are fun ones. Um. Um, I, was, I, I, I also like Otto's Irresistible Dance. Let's, and then Harm, no. Heal, I think, is a really good one. Um, I think Heal fits really well, because it's like, yeah. the eighth move is just like, oh, and they get 70 hit points back. Well, let's do Investiture of Flame um, and Investor of Ice. The other two make a little less sense. Yeah, but it's like hot and cold. Come on. Yeah. Um, um, magic jar. No. No. Um, it's prison move earth. No. I'm definitely saying auto should be on there. That's just too much fun. Okay. It's just too much fun. Yeah. I mean, they already eat, eat so much stuff to make them do weird things. Oh, you ate something. Now you're doing a little jig. That's hilarious. Okay. Uh, oh, I think that's well danced. Mm. Um, the only other one I would say would be tra uh, Tensor's Transformation. Or True Seeing. One of those two. Mm. <laughs> Let's do uh, Transformation. Because True... Um, Actually, no. Uh, you take uh, take off. Uh, find the path for true seeing because true seeing fits better than find the path. Okay. Yeah. In that case, let's do that. But let's um, do tensors and true seeing. Yep, that's what I was going to say. Take off uh, find the path tensors and true seeing. Just to hammer home, like, yo, you really want to be imbuing your allies. Right. Um, for me, um, true seeing is almost like, um, I, I see it is like in Dune when he has the spice and he's like, mm -hmm. I can see time. Mm. Um, a uh, wind walks just a minute. Never mind. I don't want to do that one. No, 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 no wind walk. I'll, it literally was th just thinking for the gaseous form. Like, oh yeah, gas. Oh no, we don't need to wind walk though. No. Nah. Um, um, okay. Seventh level. I mean, I love Draconic Transformation, but I don't think that that's appropriate. No. If, I if just that, like it. If that, if that existed, it would be for sure on a something special. Like, that would be a subclass for that. Like, it, um, it could work if there's a subclass about making dragon food, you know? Right. Um, so let's do Dream of the Blue Veil. If you get Dream, like, I don't mm -hmm. see why you wouldn't be able to do that. Um, Etherealness, I think, yep. is a really good one. And then... Regenerate? Regenerate. Uh, let's not go too far down. Let's see here. Mars Arcane, Mars Arcane, uh, Mordenkind and Sword. Um, because it's, again... Bigby's hand, spiritual weapon, this and that. This is just another. Yep. You summon, summon um, a giant cleaver. Okay. Uh, regenerate. Uh, I'm looking at power word pain, and I'm like, I love it. I don't know. That Does it not fits, fit. I, as much as like, I love it, like, like I can argue, like, oh, you haven't eat some bad shit that really fucks somebody up, but like, it's still, I think, too nasty. No, like. Maybe I could argue it for the avant-garde, but even then, it already has so many. 
bonus spells for a spell cut should max out at fifth level spells. Yeah, like it has so many. I don't. Um, sequester, perfect flavorful one. You get something that locks them in time. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Uh, uh, symbol teleport with the guys. Tether essence. Yeah, no. What does tether essence do? Oh, that's a Dune Mancy. Fuck. Fuck! Um, and <laughs> Dune Mancy gets all the cool spells, alright? Hey, it, Mr. Mercer knows what he's doing, right? Um, forward wilting is too brutal. Um,. Oh, antipathy, sympathy. No. Wait. Mm. Antipathy, sympathy, I think fits. Mm hmm. Oh, so, God. Like, why is Dark Star so cool, Saldi? It's unfair. <laughs> It's really good. That's a, anyway. Listen. Um. And feeble um, mind. That is, okay. Yeah, feeble mind. Um. You just ate some shit and you just went dumb. Definitely. Um. Ooh, glibness. No, glibness sucks. Um. Incendiary and then, cloud. Yeah. The ult, the ultimate fart. The ultimate fart. Reality break. <laughs> um. Uh, telepathy. I think it's good. Um, and then that's probably all I do for. Yeah. Um. The only other one. Small question: Have you ever had someone use uh? Oh, you gotta do definitely. My... My, uh, Mighty Fortress to do something yes. cool with it? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. So, Mighty Fortress, the thing that's, um, the thing that's nice about it, um, is you can make it permanent, which is, you know, always a bonus. Um, um, I have had a, wi a high level wizard who's like, oh, I can make my, the the people are like, oh, I'll like buy my house to do this and I'll buy this house to do this. He's like, no, I'll buy some land. And he's like, boom. And he has a fortress and he's like, I'll cast it every day for, or every seven days for a year. And I'm like, okay, cool. Now you have a whole fortress. And he's like, cool. I will also reinforce it with these demi planes and with this thing and these guards and wards and do this. And it's like, he has a giant fort with a staff of a hundred servants and like it's you know Jesus it's, Christ, it's bananas. Uh, ninth level, okay. These are going to be pretty easy and pretty short. Uh, true polymorph, for sure. Uh, I, I did know that. Um, okay. Um, yes, true polymorph. No mass polymorph. Uh, I feel like that's one or the other with those two. Yeah. Uh, now, my suggestion um, is uh, I think foresight um, I am tempted to say imprisonment, but foresight uh, power word heal, um, and, um, uh, what the fuck is it? Uh, weird. Oh, okay. I was just about to say, I was thinking weird, but cool. We're on the same page then. Or site. Um, yeah, for man, I'm not, I'm not, you know, whatever, but like, I, th I think it's a cool one. Yeah. Um, Foresight, true Power. polymorph, and weird. Or Power, heal. Um, true polymorph. Yeah, I think weird. that's. They don't really need much else because time stop doesn't make sense. Uh, the only other one I was thinking is um, uh, 
I personally like Time Ravage, but it's a really fucking nasty one, and it's a Dunamancy one. Um, okay. Otherwise, uh, Imprisonment or Invulnerability are really nice. Let's go with Invulnerability. That fits what they do. Fits what they do the best. Okay. Yeah, because True to Resurrection, I think, should only be for necrom uh, for uh, Clerics. Like, yeah, they have Resurrection, but, like, True to Resurrection is something way better. Right. Like, I feel like to do that, like, no amount of food could do that. That's over 200 years old. What food are you making that could... No. But I think these perfectly fit the main thing that you want to do with this class. Buff your enemy allies to see better, make them stronger, heal them, turn them into something weird, or fuck with someone's mind. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Oh, yeah, that's definitely a big help, because, like I said, once you get past, like, once you get to the fourth level spells, you're getting spells, I'm just like, well, if I add that, that could just make the class do <sighs> nuts all, you know, so. But I think going over these spells here, this is definitely a good jumping off point to look back into other parts in the classes. So, um, you said about 5.30 was your time, so, yeah. yeah, why don't we go ahead and stop it, because it's 5, I've been going for 2.30, we lost a little time in the beginning, but I definitely want to make this a reoccurring thing, this is fun, getting yeah, into this I'd stuff. Yeah, I'd be more than happy to, to do this any time, this was uh, super dope. Yeah. What, um, I know we wanted to talk a little bit about Dungeon 23 itself. Yes. Do we have time for that? Let's go into that. Let's wrap up with Dungeon 23, and we can call it for today. Because that definitely is, well, I mean, it's a big thing going on in D&D &D right now, so. So, it is a big thing, and I will say, I've seen all the, like, knockoff ones that I'm not as big a fan of, to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. um, because it's like, um, pardon me, I, like, I think I partially broke my chair, so I'm just... Oh, no. Figuring out myself. Um, so there's like the City 23, World Building 23, Space 23, like, okay, whatever. Do, you know, whatever floats your boat. But the Dungeon 23, what I like about it, and I think that the thing that people need to focus on is it lets you, firstly, get a nice little warm-up every day. You should not spend more than 10, 15 minutes on it. Um, really. I, the I've seen people who are like, oh, I already have like twenty rooms. I'm like, January third, son. <laughs> Stop. The key is to only do a room a day. If you have more ideas, great. Write what you want. But if I think for this this exact project, if you can limit yourself so that you can consistently do one a day and make it a habit. That is better for what this is trying to accomplish and making someone a, a good writer. Um, because I write every day and I do, I post homebrew every day and I do this. And I do that specifically where I will stop myself because if I work too much on it, then I get burned out and I'm like, oh, I gotta fucking write today. Whereas if it's just a habit that I'm like, oh, I just wrote a little thing today. Did a magic item, did a spell, did this one little thing, no mm -hmm. problem. Oh, I thought of a mo even if I don't write the whole stat block, I'm like, I thought of a monster. That's cool. I'm happy with that. Great. Um, don't do too much. <laughs> this is coming from me. Don't do too much. Um. So, like, I'm doing. Are you doing Dungeon Twenty Three this year? Um, I thought about it. I wasn't quite sure because. Uh... A big thing that I knew, like, I was like, oh, Dungeon 23 sounded really fun, but then I'm like, well, I'm working on this class, and I got this homebrew thing, and I'm like, well, let me not overwhelm myself. I want to participate, 
So, like, the way I've been looking at it, instead of, like, challenging myself to do, like, a room every day or something, what I'm thinking of is, like, hey, once a week, let's come up with a good dungeon adventure. Like, if I want my players to go in here, what would I do? What would I do? So, I I'm not doing the full challenge. I'm trying to kick it back a little bit because as fun as it, as it is, especially with me getting back into home brewing as much as I want, it seemed... A little intimidating, I guess I should say. <laughs> so, but I definitely, like, I'm having so much fun looking at everyone else's stuff. That I was like, all right, let me just do it at my own pace. I don't think the point is to, like, burn yourself out or whatever. Right. Um, so, um, what I have and what I am telling people is, like, I'm doing Dungeon 23, but I'm keeping it as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. doing just the one room a day. I... Like, when I get up in the morning, you know, the past three days, or including today, I, I'm i like, okay, what do I want to do? And I think of the room, and I think of a little thing, and I, I make a note on my phone. And, like, later in the day, if I have time, then I've, I've added them to a, a document. But this is what I have. It's the third day I've done three rooms. The mm -hmm. first one, I'm doing Alakazam's Tower. Oh, um, cool, cool. Because I, I've never fully written out everything that's in his tower. I know it because it's, it's, it's me. your character. But like um but I could play with it and really have a canon map out of what's in his tower. Okay. So this is this is what I wrote for the first day is um the first thing is his magic item showroom. When you come in off the street into his tower, it is a magic item shop. Right? So the first room I said, it um, a showroom of magical items. Uh, there are uh, several artifacts on display behind uh, uh, wall of force uh, glass cases, um, including a vorpal sword, a staff of the magi, um, and a robe of stars. Um, I said there's a cash wrap um, and a magic mouth spell if Alec is not in the room. That's all I put. That's it. I didn't describe anything else. I didn't say how big or how small the room is. There's some magic items on display. I listed a couple examples. I'm done. Mm -hmm. The second room, I said employee break room. This is attached to the back of the that first room. Yeah. I said there is a a small um, box of colding, um, uh, an abracadabras. Um, and storage lockers for employee equipment. So there's essentially, there's a refrigerator, a microwave, and lockers to put your shit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, pretty straightforward for an employee break room. Today, what I did was um, there's um, the bathrooms. So what I said for that was um, uh, uh, you know, employee, uh, restrooms, I was like, um, you know, uh, there are, it's, you know, a, um, uh, it's, you know, a double bathroom, um, I said, uh, possible encounter, um, uh, I said in, uh, a, a low CR ooze, because I thought that'd be funny. Mm-hmm. Um, I also put, uh, animate objects, toilet paper, question mark. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's all I put. Are you going to put a toilet ghost in there? I, it's possible, but, um, the, it's, th I think there's plenty of people who are like, oh, I have to do this giant thing with this huge encounter and like, I have to have all the monsters in there. You don't got to do none of that shit. What room is it? And then like, if you want to put some stuff that's in there, great. You don't have to write out a whole fucking module. That's not the point of this. What I'm doing is I'm going to have Alex Tower laid out. I have the rooms. Um, if I want to play around with the size of each room, I can. This is to get a rough draft out so you can edit it later. Mm -hmm. At the end of the year, once I have the full thing, then I'll go through and refine it. I might add some, change some stuff, make this room bigger or smaller, add more encounters to this. So if someone wants to go through his tower as part of an adventure, they can. Or I just have it, just to have. And mm -hmm. it was just fun, and it was a little warm-up I did every day for 10, 15 minutes, max. Yesterday, 
for the break room. I spent five minutes. So I was like, oh, there's a break room. It's got a uh, uh, bag of clothing and an abracadabras and some lockers. That was it. See, that, that was as much work as I put into it. See, that seems like a lot more doable in my head. Because like, when I was thinking of like, oh, each room, you need to have this and this and this. It just seems so grand in my head. That's why I was like, let me just take back and do the week thing. Because, like, yeah. when I first heard about it, the first thing that I thought was like, okay, if I was going, what would I wanted to do for this week? Like, my idea for this week is um, I wanted to reinvent some old encounters I had with uh, more fun dungeons. So, uh, there's uh, this uh, whole town with, like, lichens taking control of everything. So, I was like, oh, l let me just redo this town for a bit and like take it building by building and stuff like that is how I was thinking of it. So the first thing I literally just thought of is like, okay, this area is the way we're at district. This is where the way rats are. Um, if a player came here, they would think that the where problem is typical vermin, you know? Right. Cause like the whole, uh, the whole point of the greater old module was there is this super powerful, basically semi demigod person that has control over all lycanthropes. And they're trying to transform this whole country into a country of lycanthropes. So it's up to the player to be like, oh, you normally don't see werebears and were rats working together. That's that shouldn't happen. You know what I mean? Stuff like right. that. So I'll just doing it district by district, like, oh, this is all where rats, and this is all this area, and this is all this area. See, that's super cool, but that's that's way more work than what I'm doing. Yeah, it is. Like, thinking about it like that, I was like, oh, I could have just been like, okay, this is the mayor's office. This is where the where rat leader is. Yeah, They have a desk be... or shit in there or something like that more complex than like room by room mm -hmm. you could do like like settlement 23 like you could okay. like let's say you do a, a city over the course of this year okay every day you do a building what is this building well this is the mayor's office um so in the mayor's office he's got a couple of rooms including his private quarters his his like office where he meets people uh maybe he's got a hidden room in there that he i don't know fucks a secretary or something okay. all right work and then the next day, you're like, okay, um, next to the mayor's office, we have City Hall, like where people can go and voice their disputes, meet with some magister, do some whatever. The next day, we're like, um, over there, we have a pastry shop by City Hall where a bunch of like important people in town will go on their lunch break to get coffee and hang out or something. So if you're there in the middle of the day, hey, you can run into some important people, right? You mm -hmm. can see the mayor fucking the secretary, you know. But... Um, then you do that, and then, like, every month, see, for me, um, Dungeon 23 is, like, you do a room every day. At the end of each month, you go up or down a level. Ah, oh, yeah, so I I'm saw some people first, doing it a week. I'm yeah. doing the, fuck that. I'm doing the first floor um, this this month, and then I'm mm -hmm. going to go up and up and up, and I'm going to have 12 floors at the end of this. Oh, that's dope, yeah. Um, and that's going to include, I'll have a basement in one, and I'll do an attic, like a the top you know top of his tower and mm one -hmm. um but i'm like okay so i have 12 floors um including a basement and the top so really like 10 floors but that's not the point yeah but you could do for do a new district okay you did mm -hmm. the government district so then next in february you're like let's do the let's do like the commercial district so like okay here's the the blacksmith shop okay and then the next day you're like here's the 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 boyer or here's the magic item like the potion shop and here's the the, the guy who does scrolls and stuff, you know, and it, it it could be as simple as like here's the the potion shop. Um, they sell potions of healing for sixty gold, or mm -hmm. even be like they sell potions of healing, but they charge a little extra. Um, you know, if uh, if you're nice to the guy, he'll he'll let you like run up a tab or something. Okay. And then you don't have to describe every room in that building. Just be like, it's got this. You could be if you want to throw some extra detail. Be like. Oh, in um, here's the blacksmith shop. Um, in the basement, um, he has a a like a hidden thing that goes to the sewers. 
because he's like paranoid and wants to be able to bounce if he needs to. Or it'd be like, okay, uh, in the residential district, here's Johnny fucking who gives a shit, you know. <laughs> there's his house. Um, in the basement, he has a giant horrible ritual circle because he's trying to summon a demon. And nobody knows, you know, yeah. right? But just like one house is like fucked up, you know. Or it's like, oh, here's uh, something in the attic. He has uh, his dead wife that is, is up there that, you know, he goes up and visits her every once in a while. Do whatever you want. But don't describe every room, you know, if you want to do that. Or, like I said, if you're doing, like, the Dungeon 23, or you want to do, like, big things, keep it super, super simple. It should just be a warm-up to get you in that, that mood of, of creating where it's like, let's... uh let's have a consistent project that I work on every day. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm able to work on it every day is because there's like no commitment. It's like, I just got to remember five minutes a day. That's not hard. And if you miss a day, no big deal. The next day, do two quick rooms or be like, if you're like, oh, you know what? I want to take a couple days off. Let me do like three rooms today. And then I'll take a couple days, like the weekend to chill. Okay. You know? Yeah. That makes it sound a lot more manageable because just looking at all the different dungeons, it's all really creative stuff, but I saw yeah, this one well, dude every day, he's filling up an entire sketchbook with this crazy elaborate dungeon and lore and backstory, and I'm like, I applaud your creativity. I don't think I could pump that out every day. It, no, that's insane. That's for crazy people. Um, the I had a writing teacher, and I've seen this a few other places. This is an old saying back from probably like the 60s or 70s. But um, think about Shakespeare, right? If a guy writes a woman that he, like, you say he loves a woman and he writes her a sonnet, right? Yeah. Then he loves her, right? Because he wrote her a sonnet. If the guy writes 150 sonnets, he loves writing sonnets. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's, the woman has nothing to do with it. <laughs> so, Write what you're comfortable with. Write something super simple and easy. Just be like, oh yeah, today here's a single room. And I take it as the point of this is not to have a module by the end of it. Mm -hmm. It's to have a big empty mega dungeon that you can then think, okay, what is a reason that now that I've populated this that I can then go in. You have a rough outline that you can work with. Okay. You know? If I go and I'm like, okay, I have Alakazam's tower. Now I have the whole thing all set up. At the end of the year, I could be like, what if a cult tried to attack Alakazam's tower and they they did some sequester spell on him to stop him and, and then now they're fucking around in his tower trying to steal his stuff. Oh. The party has to go in and save him. A cult, you say? Okay. A bear-like cult, maybe. There's no way that the cult of the Alzheimer could ever get something over on Alakazam. Come on. They they no do worship cult. a giant elder god Al Albear, probably not. Yeah. I I, um, I doubt they're that smart for cult. Let's be honest. He would he would just leave out like a giant <laughs> jar of peanut butter <laughs> to distract the other. But the point is, it's like now that I have the map and I have the basic, 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 basic notes mm -hmm. for each room. Then I can build an adventure at the end of it. Don't yeah. write history and lore and adventure and all that shit. That's it. You're gonna kill yourself. You're gonna by February you're gonna be like, "Fuck this! This is a pain in the ass." I got other shit I want to do with my life. But if you're like, "Oh, I'm making a little math throughout the year," and at the end of the year, then I can have a big project so that 2024, you can spend the a few months or a year crafting a whole adventure module out of it. I'm sure, you know spring of next year i can be like boom look at this giant mega dungeon module yeah. that's like dungeon of the mad mage style here you go but i don't want that's not going to be december of of this year that's going to be it's like no i got you yeah that'd be fun well since we plan on doing this again how about a uh, mini challenge and fun for our viewers next time we meet up Let's uh, compare our Dungeon 23 progress and see where we got. I'd be very yeah. curious to see where you're going with the tower. And it'd be fun to get some feedback on this Lycan Town that I'm doing. Because I, I had really fun with it. And I, I, it, it, this is a good excuse to revisit. Because like right when the party was really getting into the juicy meat of this situation. Like 
they just figured out that uh, the boss that they talked to earlier was a were rat and tricked them and sent them down the wrong way and was ma manipulated them. Then the party fell apart, and I was like, "Are you serious? We just got to the yeah. big twist, and they're all excited. They just killed a were shark, and he lied to them." They got extra information. They're asking me a bunch of questions, and life happened. So I was like, I was really having fun building this conspiracy. Let's go back to it and refine it a bit. So, yeah, it's it, like I said, it's gonna be fun. I'll um I'll gather up my notes, and then next time we can uh, stream together, I'll um we can compare and see what we have. I'll show you. I'm sorry, you can show me a town. And um, like I said, I like the little thing we just made rolling a couple things earlier today uh, like I said, it sounds like a dope fucking idea yeah that was fun if anything if we are able to get a few more people on here and the guests we could just do hey today we're gonna quick up homebrew a dungeon and show you how easy it is to just create a basic plot sure. for your party to go through because like what we just rolled up with that could easily be a four-hour adventure if, hey yeah. figure yeah. this shit out it, you're, you're trapped here I mean I know in the DMG there's some more like rollable tables to create dungeons and stuff. So we'll play around. But this was super fun. Um, we got some some stuff done. We got the spell list, which is a big pain in the ass for a spell casting class to get that spell list down. So glad we could get that done. Yep. Um, thanks everybody for hanging out.